हेलो हेलो हाँ सर शोना जाते हैं हाँ सर शोना जाते हैं हाँ ठीक है I, Dr. Deptushi Mr. Chaudhuri, Assistant Professor, Shorojini Naidu College for Women, as an Assistant Secretary of Kolkata Society for Asian Studies, on behalf of our, our society, would like to present a gracious welcome to you all. Today's webinar is on a fiesta of 50 years of Indo-Bangladesh relations, assessing the varied dynamics of opportunities and challenges organized by Kolkata Society for Asian Studies. I'm sure it will spreading knowledge a lot. This will be a very auspicious session as we get with us uh, our Shweb Choudhury, Vice President, India Bangladesh Chamber of Commerce and Industry, IBCCI as our inaugural address speaker. And we get Dr. Prabir De, who will uh, uh, present keynote address. Dr. Prabir De, professor at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, New Delhi, and head of Asian India Center, AIC, at RIS. And with this, we get special guests. Rizwan Rahman, Managing Director, ETBL, Holding Limited, Immediate Post President, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We will start our session. And before that, first of all, I want to Welcome our president, sir. I uh, am extremely privileged to welcome you all, sir. And uh, now uh, I will, uh, I want to request our honorable president, sir, Dr. Shoto Broto Chakraborty, president, Kolkata Society for Asian Studies to address welcome to all. Thank you, Dr. Shri, my you. colleague. Respected Janab Shweb Chaudhuri, Vice President, India Bangladesh Chamber of Commerce. Respected Dr. Provid De, Professor at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, New Delhi. Respected Janab Rizwan Rahman, former President, Dhaka Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Good afternoon to everybody present online and welcome to you all to this two-day international webinar on Indo-Bangladesh relations. The status of a society is primarily determined by its economic performance in modern times. Two very vital inputs play their parts in the ultimate accomplishment. One, the level of increasing aspirations on the part of the concerned people on the one hand, and two, successful management of generating capital and handling of production technology and distribution mechanism on the other. India and Bangladesh being culturally and specially two very close neighbors embedded in almost a common frame of 
geopolitical milieu it is but natural that scholars and planners of both the countries will feel inclined to look for some strategic initiatives to be followed by each country as well as try to evolve an acceptable and meaningful space for placing each other's mutually prioritized agenda for further persuasions it is with this objective in view the kolkata society for asian studies has chosen to provide a platform where the varied issues may be raised and mutually exchanged by the participants for the next two days that is today 16th of february and tomorrow 17th of february 2023 i am sure at the end of this valuable deliberations some formidable results will emerge focusing on multiple dimensions of the problem at hand i on behalf of the kolkata society for asian studies welcome you all again please keep well in the new year thank you thank you very very much thank you sir and now this is time to inaugural address and uh, with us here is our speaker shoaib choudhury vice president india bangladesh chamber of commerce and industry ibcci thank you sir and welcome once again and uh, uh, thank you once again for giving us your precious time sir will present his speech on india bangladesh trade opportunities uh, and it will be a, a enriched session so please be with us and sir please um good afternoon uh, sir uh, excellencies distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen so uh, i provided my speech to the uh, to everybody by mail but uh, due to some of my other programs i have to go through to go to be summarize my you know speech for the today so uh, first i would like to cordially thank the kolkata society for asian studies for inviting me to say a few words about this india bangladesh business ties it is my privilege to recall the honor of the gratitude the contribution made by india in 1971 while the liberation war of bangladesh was going on and father of nation bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman and then then prime minister simuti indira gandhi played a great role during that time for independence of bangladesh so we know it was very much uh, you know uh, uh, touch relation with kolkata and as well as dagartala because of the we have in you know, a good in you know, a cultural bond with each other and many of bangladeshi people uh, took shelter in, uh, in our neighboring st- uh, states so i believe that uh, the and our relation uh, our relation with the india bangladesh is you know in, in uh, written golden letters so we cannot afford the spirit of the 1970 keeping the india side so currently india is our you know fourth uh, export destination and uh, after the poland so i believe that uh, it is not much more difference the figure uh, so if we both country is in you know, a work together how to you know develop the you know our you know export to india it will be i i believe that it will be you know uh, cross in you know, a poland too so and particularly we should take strong initiative to enhance the range of the trade and commerce between bangladesh and the northeastern indian states to make it happen we need to overcome legacy problem you know the night after 1947 there are some rules still going on if i am a bangladeshi entrepreneur if i wish to start my business in you know uh, tripura or assam or you know uh, west bengal we have to uh, face many hurdles it's not very easy to start a company in you know uh, in india uh, within week like you know european countries or or singapore malaysia etc so i believe that is is happening due to the legacy problem and we have to remove this problem as soon as possible to Uh, develop our you know export 
to India, and as well as the same issues in here too. Basically, we have to we have to welcome the you know uh, foreign direct investment in both countries. So at this moment, at this moment, I believe that uh, that but we are passing the very challenging time because of the you know harsh economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, which is you know. Uh, created a very uh, you know uh, problem for uh, or financial stress for you know all over the world. So I believe that uh, at this moment, I many of our interaction happening with the, you know our uh, neighboring uh, state and and Asian state. Just you know we have to go. We have to come up with the, you know under the one umbrella. And and one thing is you know we propose for the you know currency swap is the one of the issue. So basically, whatever the export with the India, we have to transform to our, you know, uh, trade with them with the, you know, uh, dollar to rupees. So it will be the, you know, a good idea for the, you know, at, to tackle the, you know, US uh, US currency crisis in Bangladesh as well as the India. I believe, I believe that, you know, today all our experts here, everybody will focus on this issue, how to how to introduce one of single currency in this region so like in the european union they are using the euro so we believe that if you focus on the you know a rupee based economy in this region it will be helpful to you know strengthening the, our business ties so and another issue we have to we have to uh, in bangladesh as a bangladesh entrepreneur i admired the you know indian prime minister sri narendra modi's foreign policy uh, which Emphasize, you know, neighbors first. I believe that if you think about the neighbor issues, you have to you have to make easy to uh, access to the Indian market for Bangladeshi businessmen, and or or you know or as well as the you know Indian business should come in Bangladesh with you know free minds. So, and another, if you visit the you know I don't know everybody have good idea about the you know uh, uh, our land ports land port. Land port is, you know, one of the you know, biggest uh, uh, problem is facing in basically the our, you know, northeast states. Like, you know, if you go to the, you know, uh, Assam border, you will not get, you know, good uh, uh, support from there. And there are some kind of, you know, um, some kind of, you know, export, uh, you know, products barrier there. If I export to the India, my export figure to the India is all over the India, is, you. you know. All over India is, you know, uh, anything wrong with this? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I Hello? can hear you, sir. No, sir. Please continue, sir. So, uh, so basically, uh, some kind of, some kind of, you know, restriction is going on to export product to, you know, North State, as well as North State cannot import their product to Bangladesh straightway as per the, you know, both countries' number of uh, products. It should be some kind of difference between the central government as well as the state government. I think you know it should be, it should be you know huh, minimize the problem because of you know like you know I, last uh, two months back I was in Assam for join one of the program from the India Bangladesh Chamber of Commerce. So uh, with along with our uh, special our special advisor of our Prime Minister Dr. Moshi Rahman. We we raise this issue. Uh, we also get in, you know same problem from the you know Assamese businessmen. Those are, those are you know uh, trying to you know import to Bangladesh or export to Bangladesh. They have some, they are facing facing to increase their product list to export to Bangladesh. Uh, same Bangladeshi entrepreneur also not uh, able to export the same number of products to the Assam. So I believe that this is the one of the barrier we have to. We have to, you know, make it open for, you know, uh, everybody should be equal export right or import right. So this is the you know, obstacle we face in the you know, northeast state. I believe that if you see the geographical position in Bangladesh, Bangladesh should do main business with the you know, neighboring uh, neighboring states like, you know, uh, this uh, northern region states. So I believe we are, as we are the as we are in a, we are in a geographically good position. So. Indian central government should make it easier to uh, allow to Bangladeshi entrepreneur to export our uh, our desired product to the India and Indian uh, neighboring state, northern state countries entrepreneur, they should also provide their 
visitor product to the Bangladesh, then it will be increased the you know, uh, you know, both countries' trade volume. And another issue is, you know, if you see the you know, uh, uh, medical grounds, Bangladeshi millions of Bangladeshi Bangladeshi you know, uh, patients are going to India for treatment. So nowadays, this, it, it is very difficult to uh, uh, getting the you know have their you know visa service because of the you know uh, earlier anybody can uh, India they can go to India with the tourist visa they can see meet up with the you know doctor uh, without you know be, without medical visa. So now it's very restricted very restricted law. There's no without medical visa, no Bangladeshi Bangladeshi. Uh, tourists or Bangladeshi uh, citizens not allowed to meet up with the doctors. So I believe that it should be one kind of business. So it, how to make it easy, Indian government should think about this issue to, uh, to how to win a Bangladeshi patient meet up with the Indian doctor uh, uh, for visa, visa hassle uh, to overcome the visa hassle. And another issue, the uh, Bangladesh is one of the most export uh, at this moment we are now uh, one of the top country to export the garments product to the you know um, um, uh, all over the world. So, but our you know main of our you know merchandise or our you know, technical peoples come from India and Sri Lanka. But at this moment, Bangladeshi side also giving some problem uh, to issue the visa, and and Indian government also they are also uh, they are not giving some kind of clearance of these issues. I believe that if you see see the you know uh, WTO you know. Uh, what is the you know mode for the we have you know uh, manpower supply issues that should be make easier to the you know, both countries then it will be create good opportunity for the you know uh, uh, service oriented business for both sides and India is and I believe this India is a technology hub at this moment all over the world I I propose some of the Indian hierarchy so why not huh, why not they declare the you know Bangalore is the well, uh, tech, uh, tech, uh, tech hub of the world. So uh, compared to the you know, Silicon Valley, so and where the where the Indian nationals they are you know uh, uh, take the leadership on the Google, IBM, etc. So Bangladesh, we are you know, far behind of this getting this support from the Indian side. If the Indian government supports to us, like an Indian entrepreneur come to us to establish their you know, tech uh, tech entrepreneurship in Bangladesh. It will be a you know, good window for the you know increase the you know business for both sides. But this is, I believe that you know there is some kind of mindset is here is the problem. We have to overcome the mindset. I, I from the very beginning I raised this issue. The legacy problem is the main problem for you know for us. And you know there's you know few day few years back before COVID it was very difficult to enter to the you know Sikkim because of the Bangladeshi national not allowed to. Entering Sikkim because of the you know some kind of inland permission, other permission, still this permission going on the Nagaland, Manipur, etc. I believe that everywhere when you say Bangladesh is your you know brother, we also believe India is our brother. You have to act like brother. But, but you know when I see to act, entering this state, this Bangladesh name tagged with the you know uh, which country, Pakistan, China, and the Myanmar. So. In, in during 71, uh, Pakistan, China, they took stand against Bangladesh independence. So why you are putting my name with them? You have to, you have to, you know, relieve from this type of, you know, uh, the critical issues. I when you remove this, then it will be, it will be create, you know, more trust to invest both sides. So I believe everybody here, in, everybody here, everybody knows about the, you know, global investment scenario. So. Many of you know Indian company they are they are you know, at this moment they are you know, running the show all over the world. Even last month the World Cup I was in Qatar. I have seen most of services done by the Indian professionals. So why not the you know Bangladesh getting this support? So we have to we have to work we have to work how to make it easy for everybody. I believe that here is my good uh, our you know, good business leader Mr. Rijuan Rahman is here. He was the Dhaka Chamber president. And he, he knows the obstacle of both sides. I believe he will explain more about this issue. And as a, you know, uh, as, you know uh, inaugural speech, I believe that, you know, I just face my practical, practical few, uh, uh, you know, case study I share with you. And we, if, we, if we all overcome this type of, you know, challenges, then Bangladesh, India will be 
uh, one of the good example for you know uh, business environment which will be which will be compared to like you know um, uh, Canada and the, you know uh, US trade same value so I believe Today, all speaker will focus this issue: how to make easier to business Bangladesh and India, and some obstacle we have to remove the obstacle. It will be it will be our focus point. And 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 another two three issue we have to focus at this moment, like you know, we have some agreement like in you know, a motor vehicle agreement of MBA within the countries BBIM, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal was endorsed some years ago. Uh, but the proper implementation of this agreement can be highly conductive uh, for, for the expansion of the business connection between Bangladesh and India. Bangladesh and India can execute effective measures to elevate the commercial relations under the umbrellas of Bay of Bengal Initiative for multi-sectoral, uh, technical, and economic cooperation, BIMSTEC, and Bangladesh, China, and the environment, BCIM. I think these three agreements we have to focus very strongly for uh, strengthening our relations. So, and the border has one of the good example for us is border should be increased for both sides. So, for in that region we have some informal trade between you know both countries. It will be you know it will be come down formalized way gradually. And I believe that both country will think about this issue. Then our entrepreneurship will be grow day by day. Uh, thank you everybody to giving me a chance and hopefully uh, we'll make a we will make a, you know one of the example for our our you know relation in, uh, and trade opportunities in india bangladesh and finally i just quote one of the uh, one of the quote from the helen keller uh, helen keller she is she was said working with a friend in the dark is better than working alone in the light i believe that it will be the uh, main essence of us everybody will Sharon, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all. Enriched a lot. Uh, your great speech helped us a lot to understand the subject of our webinar. You started from the legacy problem. You enlightened our foreign policy. You emphasized on our problems and the solve. We are overwhelmed and want to thank you again for such an informative session. Hope we can hear you in future also from an, another program platform of our Kolkata Society for Asian Studies. Uh, thank you once again, sir. And now, please welcome Dr. Probir De, sir. Uh, Dr. Probir De, professor at the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, New Delhi, and head of Asian India Center, AIC, at RIS. Dr. Prabhid Day, uh, sir, uh, please welcome once again. And thank you for giving us your precious time. And the topic of uh, her, uh, his uh, speech is uh, changing economic contours uh, on Bangladesh. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I congratulate uh, the organizer, uh, Kolkata Society for Asian Studies, Asian Studies, to organize such an important uh, conference. Uh, I thought that this would have been done in person, you know, physically, but somehow, uh, uh, you know, we moved into the virtual mode. Uh, virtual, uh, any discussion, debate, dialogue in virtual mode, the benefit is that you can connect many people across the world. Uh, so, and I can see uh, so many people, you know, that's uh, 47 in number. If, if you leave me out, 46 are you know, a good number of uh, people listening to you. And uh, many of them are from our neighboring country, Bangladesh. And I'm sure in years to come, will have opportunity to meet each other. And I can see here, you know, from the program, you know, many, uh, uh, many, many eminent scholars whom, you know, I, I met, I have their wisdom with me. I can see, you know, here, Professor Imtiaj Ahmed might be joining tomorrow. 
Dr. Atiur Rahman might be joining the next session. Uh, and then Professor Shapna Bhattacharji, uh, Professor Ananda Jyoti Mojumdar, King Shuk Chatterjee, uh, Professor Samir Ranjan Das, Professor Moha Mukherjee, and uh, Sri Adadatta, and many others. You know. So they will be, you know, so joining in, in this uh, conference. And, um, and I thank the organizer for uh, having thought about me to give a keynote. I have no keys to unlock many things, so I won't say it is not a keynote address, just to share my remarks uh, on the subject, on the changing economic profile or economic contours about uh, you know, India-Bangladesh relations. I've been traveling to Bangladesh you know, uh, quite often. Uh, uh, my uh, families are also not from the other from the East Bengal, we are, we are from this side of the Bengal, but I share uh, many commonalities with both uh, both sides of you know uh, the the Bengal, both East and West. So, and I have been uh, I've been to Bangladesh uh, recently, and I travelled uh, from uh, Dhaka to Chotogram to Matarbari to Cox's Bazaar to Kumilla to Brahmanberia, you know, by road by flight, you know, to do a study. Then I went to uh, Agartala. Uh, by road, and I crossed the border, and then I went to Sabroom and many places. You know, I have seen it many things. Bangladesh is having a very bit good time. You know, uh, if you haven't visited recently in Bangladesh, please you know, go there and have a look at it. Uh, yes, after the partition, the best brains of Bangladesh had to migrate out, you know, uh, leaving aside a huge you know, baggage there. Um, uh, but they have overcome it, and they have, you know, we call it in economics called catching up. Uh, you know, today Bangladesh is uh, the, the the fastest growing economy, you know, uh, in South Asia. The per capita income even more than and in India, by the way. But even even if you know, uh, we 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 don't visit, we don't meet friends, relatives, because of some things or others. Uh, both the governments have been very honest attempt, you know. Uh, to alleviate, to scale up the relations between them. So let me share some of my thoughts. And I have a written speech because organizer wanted to publish something. So, so let me come back to kind of a head down uh, statement. And but believe it, my emotion is everywhere in, in this line. And I'm sure uh, we would going to discuss some of the issues, you know, which raised by my previous speaker, who is a business person. Uh, but he raised many things, you know, which I uh, do agree. But many of the many of his points, you know, he couldn't articulate. Uh, but I could understand what he was actually telling to us. So India and Bangladesh are civilizational partners. They are say are geographical borders, both land and maritime. India and Bangladesh, you know, they could manage to resolve its maritime dispute amicably. But if you go to South China Sea, you could see this, those seven, eight countries, they are fighting each other. They could not solve it. But India and Bangladesh, they could resolve its maritime borders, the land borders, the exchange of cheat mahas, and etc. So there are many good examples, best practices, India-Bangladesh story, you know. Our relations have been expanded in all fields of bilateral relations, from culture to connectivity, to commerce, to communication, to, to capital, to care, uh, which you often call, you know, five Cs. Uh, and I repeat, uh, five C stand for culture to connectivity, to commerce, to communication, to capital, to care. Indian Bangladesh partnerships has evolved from a partner for a freedom, uh, freedom struggle of uh, um, Bangladesh coming out from East Pakistan, and to a partner for their development. Bangladesh has become the fastest growing economy in South Asia. Bangladesh, indeed, catching up in, in India and many other countries in Southeast Asia as well. And this catch up is 2019. If you see the long-term trend in the per capita income in current dollar, you will see in 2019, you know, they could touch uh, what India is to, you know, have the per capita income 2019. Today, in 2020, 2021, at the current price, uh, Bangladesh per capita income, uh, which is 24, Five eight two thousand four hundred and fifty eight dollar at current price, whereas India's is two thousand two hundred and fifty seven. 
we don't have to read much in these numbers but but the trend you know is that this bangladesh per capita income is just 128 dollar 128 dollar in 1971 and uh, if we have you know, discuss this in the Bangla, you could have seen, you know, you could understand a much better way. The Unishakato Shale, Bangladesh per capita income chilo, Matro Aksho Atas dollar, Shakantake Aski with their per capita income gachi, two thousand four hundred and fifty eight, Jeta India per capita income, two thousand two hundred and fifty seven, that's a basic. And Bangladesh is going to become a developing country, by the way, two thousand twenty six. Those who are the business people here, they know that Bangladesh rise. Uh, it is because of trade preference. Uh, trade preference, what is that? Some developed world, they give a preference to developing countries, least developed countries, to grow, to do business. So uh, they got uh, the GSP, GSP plus benefits from developed countries, you know, like United States of America, to send their, you know, garments. The government is something which is labor intensive. You know, Americans have. I've left it long back, you know, for 60, 70 years back. And every country in the world, you know, they have gone from a labor intensive to the capital intensives. Um, in India, uh, it's more about a middle of labor and capital. So Bangladesh is, is you know, over 50 years, uh, they have become an expert, uh, each and every Bangladesh is, because they have a very strong entrepreneurial economy. Protector Bangladeshi Tara Ajun entrepreneur Hotechai Abni Judikunod in Dhaka Teke. If you travel to Kumilla and then you just cut and go toward the Bamban side, Beria side, through Asuganj, and then go to Agartal, you will see both sides of the road, tiny, tiny, you know, several factories. Entrepreneur capital, you know, we don't see much uh, in uh, the Bengalis in living in those Bengal, by the way. We are more about a loan as an intellectual class. And here I see there is a, could be, you know, kind of uh, complementaries. We can make things much better. Now, Bangladesh and India story, you know, is a model of uh, partnerships in the world. Everybody, you know, in this disturbed, uncertain world where borders are, you know, dismantled, <laughs> where you know, countries are fighting each other, Ukraine, Russia, example. Uh, and countries like you know Mexico, we then see that the border has been fenced. Uh, everybody in in the world, you know, except perhaps Africa, you know, Africa is a great example where they dismantle the borders. By the way, if, uh, you know, many countries they see what's done, the good thing about India Bangladesh story. So I think there are lots of things to understand. You know, here is the model. So if not at just a bilateral level, Bangladesh and India are the partners in the SARC. Beamstick, BBIN, IORA, and many other regional forums. And those who are young here, who you know, uh, who are not very familiar with the formation of the SARC, uh, it was actually the idea of uh, President Hussein Muhammad Ersad, you know, 1995. The SARC was the brainchild of Bangladesh. And today, uh, Beamstick, you know, uh, which is the secretariat, is located in Dhaka. Bangladesh is very active in you know, vocal partners in the IORA, in the Indian Ocean Association, and many other regional and sub-regional forums. Bangladesh and India are also active members of trade agreement like SAFTA, SATIS, which is a services trade agreement. And uh, you know, they are also negotiating you know, uh, agreement in the BIMSTEC trade agreement. BIMSTEC FTA is not yet negotiated yet, you know, still going on negotiation for the last 25 years. So Bangladesh, to me, you know, is a rising star in Asia, you know, and uh, this is an opportunity for those Bengal northeastern states, eastern states. The rise of Bengal, rise of Bangladesh has a lots of things to offer to us. So also, you know, uh, the rise of India has a lots of things to offer to in the neighborhood. By 2030, you know, Bangladesh would like to become an 500 billion economy. This number will be little bit bigger. In today's the GDP size of Bangladesh is 461 at current price, to current dollar. Uh, it could be, you know, more than four, 500 billion in, by 2030. And Bangladesh Prime Minister's vision to, to take the Bangladesh to the Malaysia by 2040 and become in one trillion the GDP size. Mane uni 
বাংলাদেশের জনগণকে বলেছেন যে আমি তোমাদেরকে কোয়ালালামপুর স্ট্যাটাসে নিয়ে যাব এন্ড আমি যেটা দেখেছি দেখছি এবং সেটা সম্ভব and uh, the year uh, 2026 in between you know bangladesh could, is going to face an enormous challenge because they will elevate from a least developed country to a developing country now once they elevate from a ldc to developing country they have to leave out all the trade concessions trade concessions gulo aste aste american company gulo withdraw kore nebe because trade concessions are given to only to the least developed countries africa the নিয়ে যাবে অন্য জায়গাতে সো বাংলাদেশ উইল হ্যাভ এ বিগ প্রবলেম ইউনো আফটার টোয়েন্টি টোয়েন্টি সিক্স টু ইউনো টু দ্য রাইজ ইজ এ ডেভেলপিং ইনফ্রাস্ট্রাকচার লিঙ্কেজেস নাও দিস ইজ গোয়িং টু বি এ বিগ হেড উইন্ড ফর বাংলাদেশ দে আর ইন্টালেকচুয়াল পিপল হোম আই ইন্টারেক্ট সাম অফ দেম দে আর এভার অফ ইট দে আর ভেরি স্ট্রং ইউনো হিউম্যান ক্যাপিটাল ইউনো নেক্সট টু ইন্ডিয়া and this is bangladesh they have a very strong cluster of you know you know very strong knowledge people you know they are looking at the country very very closely and what bangladesh has done and has been doing is that they're looking what india has been doing looking east uh, so bangladesh is at the moment you know very busy in you know looking at a free trade agreement or comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with japan with india several southeast asian countries you can see the ministry of foreign affairs ministry of commerce of bangladesh their tweets uh, several people like uh, salim raihan or or many others who are part of you know uh, the bangladesh state negotiation if you follow their tweets you will see bangladesh has opened discussion with indonesia singapore thailand philippines malaysia to sign the nfta because they need bilateral free trade agreement to sell their goods and i see there is a session today uh, even though Uh, in or maybe t- tomorrow there is an activist on that so we would request uh, the participant to tell us in which way bangladesh is moving you know strategically and also in economically bangladesh is also negotiating ftas with in uh, india is about to negotiate and also in japan so india japan and bangladesh is going to be a free trade area sometime maybe 7 8 years from now so this will be a big opportunity for both west bengal in india northeast and uh, as well as bangladesh and japan when i visited recently to bangladesh i met a company called mitsubishi the country head of mitsubishi told that they are giving a training to bangladesh is very specialized technology you know to export seafoods halal foods with a certain standard in markets in in africa in several parts of southeast asia So what I see that lots of Japanese companies, Korean companies, they are doing business very peacefully, amicably, in, in, besides India. Uh, Bangladesh has also dispatched a senior diplomat to ASEAN and opened a mission in you know, ASEAN, Bangladesh, a full mission in ASEAN. Can you imagine that Bangladesh has an ambassador to ASEAN? So all this means that they are very desperate to pick up new friends in trade, in the trade and investments. Bangladesh exports several labor intensive goods such as pharmaceuticals processed foods consumer durables uh, Bangladesh trade may suffer if the country you know fails to improve its connectivity within within the country and and the beyond uh, well uh, to bridge the connectivity gap and the going forward the Bangladesh requires increased capital expenditure for this country's infrastructure uh, particularly for the energy either domestically sourced or co-financing with international donors uh, and it is a big challenge you know if you look at is the bangladesh at the moment is a very very serious you know financial crisis they are not disclosing it they're not disclosing it for several reasons and uh, they they have you know getting um, loan from imf uh, inflation is a big challenge for bangladesh you know across the country Uh, so bangladesh cannot borrow much you know uh, if you do borrow money there will be an interest for it right it is very simple like you know amra jodi taka bank theke ni amake ferot dite hobe ebong amake tar sathe principal amount ami interest dite hobe so bangladesh uh, the rating it has it, it cannot borrow money so what i think the bangladesh has to do you know uh, the basically the gdp ac- accelerations 
that growth acceleration has to come with the more capital inputs, labor inputs. Money, this ke aro onik active hota hobe, productivity bada hota hobe. Cheta ekta bepar. We call it, you know, in very frequently in economic science called TFP, total factor productivity. You the total factor productivity bade money country's efficiency bada hota hobe. Desher. Kira kam bade je shobai thik mato kaj korte, thik shobai asche, bhalo quality. Uh, output bache. Sita ke amra bolli TFP, total factor productivity. That be the bare. Tabe desher aro unno thi hobe, aro varo unno hobe. Loan there is a limitation. Aar ekta ki hota pare. What next is that they have to allow FDI, you know, reforms for uh, you know domestic reforms to more foreign direct investments for the country. Mong jeta uta kore asche. Here I think there is a very strong role of Indian FDI coming to Bangladesh. And uh, Bangladesh Prime Minister's vision that to have a hundred EPZ, SEZ industrial parks in the country, hundred extra economic processing zone to report to Bangladesh. And what these e economic processing zones are supposed to do, they will house investments, foreign capital. India is doing such too. Ekta <coughs> hoche another one somehow in the Jossor or you know western side. Uh, but there is an issue that the gentleman you know my previous speaker he raised you know, that uh, Bangladesh FDI is not allowed in India. As you know that this is a big issue and I'm sure the government is in Bangladesh they will sort it out. They are very high quality, good quality diplomats. Uh, and it is that Bangladesh FDI is not allowed in automatic route. It is by case to case. So it, it is certainly, you know, India has to recipro reciprocate, allowing, you know, free flow of investments coming from Bangladesh uh, to in India as well. Today, the way Bangladesh has been doing in developmental activities is unbelievable. And I have shared some of them. I visited recently, you know, across the country and I have seen uh, two, three examples. I'll do, you know, I'll give the high-speed railway line from Dhaka to Chottogram to Cox's Bazaar. Then Bangabandhu Tunnel, you know, cutting across um, the Kornofuli River, because the river Kornofuli, it is origin is Mizoram state, you know, from the water uh, bodies that get dried up, and the river is basically silted. It is basically has become a tidal river. So Modro theke jokhon joar asbe, no dite jol asbe, tokhon amader Kolkata port er moto onikta. Uh, but advantage of Kolkata port and uh, Haldia port is that our ports are impounded. The log gate was We are safe. But Kornofuli River and the Patanga International Terminal and others are on the river. Uh, so there are many challenges Bangladesh you know, have been facing in terms of port development. So what they have done, you know, they are going further down at setting up a big deep sea port at a place called Matarbari. Uh, and it is between Chotogram and Cox's Bazar. Matarbari Nam are after you the Kunodin Giatakan Tripurate, Udaipure, Shekane Matripura Shoreta Bundi Roche, the Kamravoli Matabari. So actually, both are same. Uh, 1501, there was you know, Islamic in, in, you know, invaders which are coming to this side, and uh, it was unsafe uh, to keep uh, uh, the you know. Devi um, Tripura Shari uh, in the Chotogram. So they have taken it back with the Chotogram, Kumilla, all those as a part of the king of the Maniko, you know, the, the Bourbon family. They used to be the rulers. So so it was taken from Matarbari, from uh, Chotogram all the way to Matabari in Udaipur, whereas still Mata Tripura Shari is still. So there is a cultural, religious, civilian linkages. So they are setting up a big four. Uh, at Mata, with the Chinese Japanese assistance, power plant, economic zone, many things. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, and please have a vis visit it. And I think 10 years from now, when this project gets completed, all their cargo, export and import, and even from the post Bengal, they will come to Matanbari port because 10 years or 15 years from the port of Kolkata, all, the, all will be get silted and dried up and will work as a as an inland port. So what I see is that there are opportunities from both the sides. So bringing, you know, northeastern part much closer to Bangladesh through Agartala, 
Sabrum, Ramgar, Chortogram, Matarbari, Cox's Bazaar. This would be becoming a gateway economic corridor very soon. And see that in Bangladesh, today Bangladesh is the mobile phone they use, Samsung, they don't import because, because it is the Koreans, they have started assembling. And the motorbikes they use, the two-wheeler, they don't import. It is the Japanese Honda, you know, they have an assembly plant. And they are planning for you know big assembly for several others, four wheelers. And as you as I've said, that they have a an entrepreneurial class. So so I see they're expanding very much. Walton, Pran, Bextinko, many others. I don't understand why they don't invest in uh, in in Ost Bengal <coughs> or in the northeastern part. But there are areas where we can see many investments, both Bangladesh and Ost Bengal is the government sector, infrastructure, connectivity, construction, processed foods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let me uh, come to uh, the last part of presentation, and I will wind up. Uh, that uh, uh, what what we see, you know, um, the Bangladesh rise good for us, you know, and there should be some discussion here. Rise of Bangladesh is essential for the rise of sub region. Uh, an economically prosperous Bangladesh is good for for bringing youth of the country, not to join and get diverted into into fundamentalism, insurgency, etc. So we see a peaceful coexistence of, of India and Bangladesh very much. Uh, India-Bangladesh relation, to me, is, is the best hedge. In the last visit to the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, in the September 5th and 8th, you know, uh, we the signed several agreements, and there are, some of them are very good. Bangladesh has allowed their ports to be used for transit cargo from the mainland India or rest of India with the Northeast. For example, the, the Tata Steel, you know, they have a plant at Kharagpur, uh, you know, and then uh, the steel products like TMT bar, which is required for construction in the Northeast, they are sending it from uh, Kharagpur all the way to Haldia. Then they put it in the barge. That barge goes into Asuganj and then uploaded into truck and vehicle and that cross to Agartala. And, Akhaura, and then distributed to all their distributors. So here, Bangladesh has allowed Indian you know, goods coming to Mongla, Asuganj, and some other you know, in ports for the use of transit. This is the kind of a very generous support that Bangladesh government has extended. And we have reciprocated uh, as well uh, that under the BBIN motor vehicle agreement hasn't come out, but under the bilateral relations, we have allowed Bangladeshi vehicles to come cross Bangladesh and go to the Nepal and many other places and so, so uh, there are many other several stories. India has, uh, you know, um, jointly unveiled, you know, you, you need to wonder the, the Moitri Super Thamar Prabhas plan, which is, which is the first phase has been inaugurated, which is in Ramphal uh, in Bangladesh, Rupsa Railway Bridge in Khulna, signing a project management consultancy contracts for two railway lines at Khulna Darshana and Parvatipur Karuna uh, Kaunia railway line, uh, and all are you know, supplying several rolling stock like broad gauge railway line, etc. Et so the cooperation in, in India and Bangladesh has been extended, it has you know, very from selected areas to very multi dimensional, very broad based areas. It covers tourism, environment, health, education, and many others. And if you visit Indian High Commission, you know, their web page in Bangladesh. I commission and deputy I commission. It's very uploaded with information that you want. And Bangladesh and India, they share 4,000 or 4,000 kilometers of long borders, by the way. Managing the borders is a big issue because this border is used, you know, for uh, many other you know, economic purpose and also the security threats, particularly non-traditional security threats. Uh, illegal, you know, uh, fake currency, human trafficking, illegal drugs, uh, and illegal human beings. You know, anti-corruption activities all are used by this, and this is nothing new. You know, if you do, if you come uh, economically closer, uh, if you open up the border, then the informal sector, unorganized sector, will be using it. It is there, like you know, anywhere in the economy, it is very natural. We need to strengthen our security system so that you know, uh, we our our economy gets benefited. Now, 
i i would say you know some of the you know projects where i think on the trade front in 2021 and 22 the total trade is 18 billion many of the time you know it has been complained by bangladesh that our deficit is rising you know this is purely political bangladesh has a trade surplus with uh, america india has a trade surplus with america india has a high trade deficit with china bangladesh also trade the de- deficit surplus these are the things are they are very common in economic sense today's deficit can become tomorrow surplus and tomorrow surplus can turn into a deficit india has a surplus with many of the southeast asian countries but signing and free trade agreement we went in deficit but but look at india's uh, state surplus with america and many others because we indian economy needs lots of parts and components and inputs to grow up to feed our finished goods to send it to the globally so this is don't read much in it you know and don't be sentimental but the point is that out of that 18 billion bilateral trade the bangladesh export is about 2 billion and this 2 billion export bangladesh it was just 5 years back bangladesh export was something around the number i have 686 million in you know, 2017 and 18 at the current price market bags i'm talking about so in 5 years 5 bochore 700 million theke bangladesh er export india te 2 billion mane 2000 million export koreche 25 ta item chhara india bangladesh ke sob item khule diyeche ekhane kono ar kono restrictions nei but even then you know uh, they complain uh, we have high deficit but it's quite natural you know economics who understand trade they don't complain that's it that is this is very very organic things there are issues i understand which um, the previous gentleman uh, very rightly said you know they face um, you know which are uh, not needed they face huge trouble at sending their export to the north east particularly in assam but when i was standing at icp at agartala and akhaura i seen it no problem that all are loaded vehicle with the pran fruit juices pran you know many other products very quickly they are getting it cleared and coming out to the icp you know uh, store warehouse and then ultimately distributor there are issues in the assam and you know you can understand what i'm telling you but certainly some people chuki chu lok assam northeast there are nije the risk ke samasta kore tara delhi te kotha shone na nije the risk ke kore because there is a high corruption part you can understand okay uh, i i have highlighted um, many of the issues um, both economic front non economic areas the major development in india and bangladesh is the energy front that we are supplying 1160 megawatt plus power from bahrampur and we are going to you know setting up several power plants etc etc in bangladesh one is already first phase is inaugurated there will be something for which a dis- discussion is happening from jharkhand all the way to going to the power to the bangladesh so bangladesh air power shortage by 2025 onek tai make up hobe just not because of india there are several others all are thermal coal based fire plant but coal based coal fired power plant are not good for the environment by the way <coughs> india has extended many line of lines of credit in the 8 years 8 billion you know, total you know our lines of credit to the bangladesh in some last few years and uh, some of them are like development of akhaura agartala railway line expressway আপনারা যদি এখন আপনি যান রোড দিয়ে ঢাকা থেকে আগরতলা আপনি আশুগঞ্জ ভৈরব ব্রিজ ক্রস করার পরে ভৈরব নদী ক্রস করার পরে আপনি দেখবেন কি যে থার্মাল পাওয়ার স্টেশনটা যেটা আশুগঞ্জে রয়েছে সেখান থেকে ফার্টিলাইজার প্ল্যান্ট রয়েছে সেখান থেকে ইন্ডিয়ারা এক্সপ্রেসওয়ে তৈরি করছে স্ট্রেট ইউ নো সো সো সেভারাল থিংস ইউ নো রেলওয়ে লাইন এক্সপ্রেসওয়ে অ্যাক্রস দা কান্ট্রি ইউ নো দিস কামিং আপ সাম আর চায়না ইজ কামিং সাম ইন্ডিয়া ইজ কামিং সাম some uh, you know um, uh, japanese are coming and many others you know this is a very good time and i'm, I'm sure the bangladesh is managing it well uh, there are complaints like the visas and bangladesh they come often in you know, treatment and indian government gives more than a million visas and j jarai apply kore onekei multiple entry visa dewa hoy kichu kichu karone restrictions ache but all i think 
that uh, the, uh, you know this is an opportunity for india for trading and health services and uh, across the country by the way bangladesh also you know if you do a summary please keep in mind there is a health city has come out in the impol manipur eastern side of bangladesh there is a health you know cluster has grown up in guwahati which is you know north east part of so they should also explore you know coming to you know not just coming to kolkata uh, and uh, any other parts of india they should also look at uh, the new centers in you know, india uh today bangladesh india relation is not competitive but collaborative and constructive uh and but we also need a matching progress the way bangladesh is growing if we can't uh, you know do uh, development and growth in the northeast and eastern part of india so there will be a gap some of the speakers might you know allude to us on that line going forward i would recommend that both india and bangladesh may work in the areas of trade infrastructure digitization green economy women led development and regional integration uh, india has invited bangladesh to join g20 summit in september this year as you know that india is the chair of g20 i'm sure india's experience so g20 at the end of the year should be shared with all the development partners you know uh, time and tide don't wait for anybody right you agree with me so it is the bangladesh time bangladesh moment and we better do not miss this tide so we should you know engage more with them at the end i thank uh, kolkata association for asian studies for organizing such a valuable conference touching several interesting topics on pro bono basis pro bono basis i i underline you know this is only possible in poschim bangla where there is a will there is a way i thank all the speakers participants president dr chakraborty and dr karnishta Uh, the secretary for the invitation to me i thank my co-panelists dr shweb choudhury uh, mr rijwan roman and um, and uh, mr arinda mukherjee uh, for um, i thank all of you for listening to me thank you very much namaskar thank you sir our keynote address session reach its main point through your precious word to unlock our motto of webinar your remarks are so precious uh, through a lot of example you focused on changing economic uh, contours of ba- bangladesh you focused the cause behind the changes you focused on the geographical uh, aspect cultural aspect economical aspect and emotional aspect too uh, uh, this uh, this was such a informative session uh, and uh, thank you once again sir uh, now uh, i am extremely privileged to welcome our special guest uh, but but before that uh, a humble request to all that please follow the chat box uh for feedback link please fill up the form online and uh, i can see some uh comments in uh, comment box uh i can say one thing uh to mr dipankar shaha that uh, the relation is based on how we think uh, that is not true for all means uh, and my humble request to all of you that if you have any questions you can ask sir through their mails and uh, now uh, please welcome our special guest rizwan rahman sir uh, managing director etbl holding limited immediate past president dhaka chamber of commerce and industry uh, his uh, topic is 50 years of india bangladesh relations towards the next level of trade and investment growth welcome sir please Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you. I would like to humbly thank uh, Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for giving me the opportunity to say a few words, and <clears throat> it makes my life uh, very difficult after two prominent speakers have already given so much information and said so much more than I can actually share. But however. I represent the private sector of Bangladesh it is going to be a completely private sector perspective and again once again I thank the organizers for organizing such an interesting talk and uh, all the audience here assalamu alaikum namaskar and a very good evening to all of you um 
We already heard from uh, Dr. Pravide regarding uh, the macroeconomic indicators of Bangladesh, which obviously has been a, a success story in the last uh, decade, in fact, over a decade now. Um, right after bouncing back from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, our GDP growth has recorded to 7.25% in the fiscal year of 2022. And not only that, we have been proven to be the fifth most resilient economy in the world for the quick pandemic recovery. And at the same time, as you know, that uh, Bangladesh is poised to graduate into a developing economy after 2026. And at the same time, we have a vision as laid out by the Honorable Prime Minister, which is the vision 2041 to become a developed nation. And we are on the path because the indicators are saying so. There was a time that Bangladesh used to market itself in the whole world, to India, to the West, everywhere in the European Union. But right now, Bangladesh is being advertised by others. I mean, you will see Bangladesh in the news, like CNN and BBC highlighting us. Uh, you will see comments from IMF, World Bank, and all these um, ADB and so on. And at the same time, you know that Bangladesh is the fourth largest export destination for India. And it consists of... Uh, 25% of our total trade, the India-Bangladesh bilateral trade. So therefore, I must say that India, not only from its role 52, 53 years ago, back in 1971, but onwards has been a very integral partner of Bangladesh in the development story and the success story behind the um, growth of Bangladesh itself. Now, being at the intersection, uh, Bangladesh being at the intersection in the, um, between South Asia and Southeast Asia, occupies a very strategic position geographically in the Indo-Pacific region. And this strategic position, um, um, not only it creates the connectivity, but it creates a huge leverage for Bangladesh and India to enhance bilateral trade and also the um, other regional members of the Southeast Asian community annexing with other countries, especially the BIMSTEC and beyond Asia. Now, there is uh, various agreements which uh, Dr. Praveer has already mentioned regarding um, the BBIN and the um, BIMSTEC and, uh, you know, at the same time, it is very um, utmost important for Bangladesh to get into the SEPA agreement with India, which already has been worked on thanks to the uh, state visit of the Honorable Prime Minister of India to celebrate the birth centenary of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, back in 2021. And at the same time, uh, just for your update, uh, fiscal year of 2021 and 2022, the bilateral trade was $9.8 billion, which has grown to $15.68 billion, which shows that, you know, both the economies are picking up. Now, Bangladesh's uh, Indian export to Bangladesh has grown up to $13.7 billion, with a, which is actually, even though it's a huge trade imbalance for Bangladesh, but Bangladesh has huge demand for Indian products. Now, our export basket primarily is limited to RMG, of course, but we are concentrating on the diversification, which includes plastic products, leather products, agro-based products. And now the other one, which is jute, the golden fiber. This is something that creates a bit of a trade barrier between India and Bangladesh, because I believe that not only the World Bank says so, we don't see any reason why the bilateral relation between India and Bangladesh should be any less than $20 billion uh, at this point of time. Now, there is an anti-dumping duty on jute, which ranges from 19 to $350 per ton. Now, if you look at the anti-dumping duty, uh, the rules, if any country is importing more than 60% of its products from a single country, then you provide that anti-dumping duty on that specific country. But we know for a fact that Bangladesh is not exporting 60% of total of India's requirements. So I had the privilege when I was the president of Dhaka Chamber for the last three years, I'm currently the immediate past president and a director of the board. So, however, all my statements are completely individual. But again, this is a private sector perspective as well, but not a chamber perspective. So I had the privilege of meeting various ministers and business community leaders during a delegation where I took 50 businessmen with me to West Bengal. And we had these conversations and we saw that the gap um, is actually on the diplomatic level. On the private sector level, we are very much united because if you think about the success story of Indian foreign investors in Bangladesh, I can give you a simple example like Mariko. The parachute oil, they have set up a company here and the model has been so successful and this is probably 
one of their most successful offshore business units, and they have taken millions of dollars repatriated as dividends back to India. So that is one success story. And then there is various other institutions that have been doing similar businesses here. But at the same time, like I said, the anti-dumping duty, this is even though the central government uh, has to uh, have a proper negotiation with the Bangladesh Ministry of Industries as well. And at the same time, there are very stringent rules of origins which needs to be addressed. There are non-tariff barriers. And then uh, reciprocation of the Bangladesh Standard and Testing Institute. What happens that also hampers the trade of... Uh, uh, Indian goods coming into Bangladesh as well, because if the um, trade is not reciprocal with the testing labs, what happens, for example, when we are sending something by the land port, um, all the products are being sent all the way to Haryana or Delhi or somewhere or the other to get tested, and then they come back. That creates a huge time lag. And this is actually rising up the cost of doing business for no reason. And this is equally uh, affecting both the uh, countries, both India and Bangladesh. <coughs> and then, to be honest, there are 12 major land ports that Bangladesh is interacting with. They need to be developed. They need to be automated. And at the same time, we have four land ports that we are actually constantly pushing our government that, you know, uh, we don't have to look into Western markets. We don't have to look into European or Southeast Asian markets. We have so much trade to do with our neighbors. And the Act East um, or the Loop East or however you want to say it, I believe that, you know, there will be, this will be the most beneficial for India when Bangladesh can be a bridge between West Bengal and the Northeast region. You know, because these two regions are so close to each other, but geographically, but yet so far, because there's a country in between, there is a transshipment agreement, there's a transit, but I think that Bangladesh being the bridge and opening up the borders between Northeast and Bangladesh and vice, similarly vice versa with West Bengal as well. So at that point of time, I think that, you know, when we work more on the BIMSTEC, BCIM, and the uh, motor vehicle agreement, which is the BBIM. If these things are negotiated properly, and these uh, member countries, which are of these trading blocks, can actually have easy, easy access to all these trading zones, uh, especially from Bangladesh to the Northeastern state, uh, whether it comes to construction, FMCG, garments, uh, including, um, most importantly, we need to emphasize on our port infrastructure. Now, another target, for Indian businesses to come into Bangladesh. This is a very important information because Bangladesh, to reach that goal of 2041, needs $320 billion worth of investments in infrastructure. Bangladeshi companies cannot do this. Chinese companies are coming into Bangladesh. Other companies are coming into Bangladesh. Indian companies are in a very small capacity. So I would definitely, through you, your channel, and all of these uh, associations, I would like to invite all the big infra companies to come into Bangladesh. And at the same time, uh, the rules of the Bangladesh Investment Development Authority are plenty available. You know that we are providing up to 20 years of tax holidays for foreign investors, 100% capital repatriation, uh, ownership of land. But yes, Dr. Pravidya did say that some of these treaty um, uh, foreign investment cooperation that we provide to our Indian counterparts is not reciprocal. So at the same time, uh, very few limited companies have had success story. Bangladeshi companies in India, uh, they have, but it's, it makes uh, the process so complicated that other companies cannot open up shop there. And at the same time, uh, if we talk about FDI, uh, the FDI stock in Bangladesh from India is roughly fairly below $1 billion. So for a country that has a potential to trade $20 billion with uh, Bangladesh, I believe that $1 billion worth of FDI is not high enough. It should be furthermore. But however, I think that a free trade agreement or SEPA will definitely open multiple avenues in the field of ICT, industrial skills, um, for IR technologies, and then you know taking into account the economic, geographic, and strategic benefits India can invest in Bangladesh as the proven investment hub. Because at the same time, when these numbers are going up and Bangladesh is growing, there is no stopping Bangladesh, and this has been a success story everywhere. Even the Indian media is highlighting us today. So I think that the Indian investors should take a piece of the action and enjoy their dividends at the same time. And now taking um, the importance of the bilateral relation of India into account, the private sector has been working relentlessly. And I assure you, not because I'm the Bangladeshi private sector, but I also believe that we are by far the most resilient private sector. Um, the only probably one of the very few countries in the world during the pandemic, 
we posted 6.2% positive GDP growth when the global GDP growth on an average was negative 3%. So which means that our resilience, our RMG industry, our labor force, they have been showing utmost resilience. And uh, given uh, when the negotiation with the SEPA started, I think uh, India has projected that their trade with Bangladesh may be doubled up to $32 billion. So it's a win-win situation for both the countries. This is going to create more employment in our respective countries, add more to the GDP. Yes, both our GDP uh, per capita is fairly low, but we are extremely densely populated countries in the world, both India and Bangladesh. However, um, we have to look into the um, further details of the treaty. So make sure that it is actually a bilateral, but not a unilateral treaty as it has been before. And taking the importance of the bilateral relation of India into account, we have been, like I said, uh, working very relentlessly, especially the private sector. And West Bengal, needless to mention, it is the major, ultimate major gateway for Bangladesh and India towards the economic operations. And um, as I mentioned, the large business delegation we took to West Bengal, um, I'm happy to say that, you know, four or five major companies have actually signed agreements and they have always already started trading. I think if I'm not mistaken, 30 to $40 million worth of trade has happened through our delegation. So what I would suggest is we keep this um, aura alive, you know, keep sending delegations to Bangladesh through, you have the FIKI, you have the CII, you have the Bengal Chamber, you have the Kolkata Chamber and so many others. And we have made various bilateral chambers. And of course, IBCCI playing a huge role in the India-Bangladesh uh, Chamber, which is playing a huge role in the uh, bilateral relations of both the countries at the same time, Dhaka Chamber, as well as our apex body, which is the uh, FBCCI. Both have been playing important roles. And I think that, you know, it's very um, easy to connect to a country uh, so similar in culture, so similar in eating habits, so similar in nature. So our economic uh, graduation-led transition, <clears throat> it also requires a smooth uh, business competitiveness, which I think that India can definitely help us because India itself has been a success story. And now it is a global superpower. There's no denying that. The whole world is talking about that as well. So I think, you know, uh, when the neighbors grow together, the region becomes more and more competitive and that becomes the economic hub globally and the readiness to secure the new markets as well as, you know, sustenance of the uh, conventional markets. And therefore, in line with the game-changing uh, economic transformation vision, Bangladesh needs to unleash the business potentials in new destinations and India, needless to mention, the most trusted and long-held economic partner of Bangladesh may extend support by addressing the pressing cross-border issues to achieve the inevitable economic milestones and balanced economic conditions onwards and long-cherished graduation into a developing country. Because uh, like I said, uh, 53 years ago, uh, it's been uh, more than uh, 50 years now that India has been a party to the development of Bangladesh. So we believe that, you know, they have a major role to play. And uh, ultimately, the goal should be that, you know, uh, we prosper in the region and become the ultimate destination, like, you know, how the Southeast Asian uh, nations have proven, you know, the Kuala Lumpur, uh, Bangkok, um, in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and so many other countries, they have been able to attract foreign investments. And at the same time, we want to be in that position. And I think that, you know, uh, joint cooperation will ultimately take it forward. As long as the diplomacy is concerned, that's the job of the diplomats. But as far as the private sector is concerned, I don't believe that India and Bangladesh has any borders. You know, it's just a diplomatic border that we have, and it's just we need uh, a convenient business environment, um, tax-friendly regime for both parties to come in together, and that way I think we can eventually create a success story that we have always cherished from the day one. Thank you, everyone, for your patient hearing. Thank you, sir. It was so informative session. The history, the economic state, especially GDP growth, became so clear through your speech, you share your own experience and made easy to understand the matter. You also focused on the population by uh, bilateral relation. Your suggestions are so helpful, sir. Thank you once again. I uh, hope uh, we can hear from all our three speakers of these sessions again. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, and uh, I request once again, our online audience, please follow feedback link. And now please 
welcome our honorable secretary madam of kolkata society for asian studies and convener of this webinar dr pramishtha devash basu for vote of thanks please welcome madam good evening everyone we are overwhelmed uh, and grateful to all the national and international guests uh, for a graceful beginning of this webinar to celebrate the 50 years of indo bangladesh relations we are thankful to support our endeavor uh, with your valuable presentations uh, on this auspicious occasion i am taking the privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of kolkata society for asian studies and my own behalf i express my gratitude to dr shotobhuto chakraborty president kolkata society for asian studies for beginning this session with his welcome address i express our gratitude to mr shweb choudhury vice president india bangladesh chamber of commerce and industry for delivering so impressive erudite and such a significant lecture and make the inaugural successful i also express my warm gratitude to dr probit de professor of research uh, and information system for developing countries for delivering the keynote address of the webinar and make uh, clear the uh, make clear the uh, relevance of organizing this event at present time i am definitely thankful to mr rejuan rahman managing director etbl holding limited immediate past president dhaka chamber of commerce and industry to present his thoughtful and meaningful deliberation at the present state of negotiation between the two nations uh, i also want to thank dr deptushi mr choudhury assistant secretary kolkata society for asian studies and assistant professor shorjini naidu college for women to conduct the session successfully uh, i am thankful to dr orchita ghosh executive member kolkata society for asian studies to prepare the concept of this event and coordinate all the paper presenters and uh, take the responsibility to collect uh, the write ups for the edited follow uh, we publish all the papers uh, in future i extend my hearty vote of thanks to the honorable guests for their kind consent to be present here and thank all the audience for their kind presence and active participation finally i would like to take the opportunity to place on record a special thanks to mr somitra kumar bosh member kolkata society for asian studies for coordination and support uh, mr tomogno rai for technical support technicians for assistance dr orpita bosh treasurer of kolkata society all the members advisory body members kolkata society for asian studies for the logistic support and advice extended towards all of us for organizing this event successfully thank you all once again namaskar so here we end our inaugural session uh, we will meet again in first academic session thank you all we can start our first academic session now let us see yes
the chairperson will uh, join late uh, so we can start with the first uh, lecture by dr atul rahman dr shri okay okay mm -hmm. so welcome once again and uh, we will start our first academic session uh, in our first academic session our uh, keynote speaker is dr atiur rahman honorary professor department of development studies dhaka university and former governor bangladesh bank his topic is regional connectivity and sustainable economic recovery for south asia please welcome sir we are overwhelmed that uh, you uh, despite of your busy schedule uh, you are uh, giving us your uh, you are giving us uh, your precious time please welcome sir welcome once again dr atiur rahman sir honorary professor department of development studies dhaka university and former governor bangladesh bank i think uh, there is uh, some connectivity problem as i couldn't see sir uh, in our present list in call list please wait for a moment now we will hear on regional connectivity and sustainable economic recovery for south asia from dr atiur rahman sir please wait let me thank the organizer for organizing this very timely conference you know the theme of the conference is a fiesta of 50 years of indo bangladesh relations indeed bangladesh and indian relationship has been baptized in blood back in 1971 millions of our brothers and sisters had to leave their homes and go to adjoining border areas of india to save their life and properties we must thank the indian people and the government for giving not only giving shelters to these millions of the refugees but also for helping us 
in various capacities to liberate the occupied Bangladesh. Hundreds of Indian soldiers shed their blood in the war field which was jointly commanded by India and Bangladesh Army. Since then, the Bangladesh and India worked hand in hand in reconstructing the war ravaged Bangladesh. We didn't have even one dollar in our reserve. The Indian currency, the Indian finance were all available for reconstructing Bangladesh. Even the Indian human beings, officials, came forward to start the new government. But fortunately, the reconstruction of Bangladesh went on pretty well with the support from our neighbor and international allies. And very quickly, the then Prime Minister of India, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, was farsighted enough to take back the soldiers, the Indian soldiers from Bangladesh to create an environment for further development of the uh, relationship between the two countries. Since then, we are working together for social economic development of our people and both countries are really benefiting from the close cooperation uh, not only in the social and economic areas but also in the cultural areas. In fact, we share the same heritage, we share the same culture, we share the same infrastructures which was disrupted in 1965 and together we are trying to rebuild those infrastructures, we are trying to really reconstruct our broken uh, 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 relationships and culture and uh, uh, both countries are really benefiting from this close economic cooperation and cultural cooperation. Our foreign policy is also anchored on a very amiable relationship between the two countries and South Asia. So given this perspective, I will be speaking in depth on the economic ties <coughs> between uh, the two countries, particularly focusing on trade, investment and business cooperation. Indeed, both India and Bangladesh are now emerging economic powerhouses. The whole world is watching us and if we can cooperate, if we can play our games together, both of the countries can indeed attract a lot of foreign direct investment and also we can really help each other in augmenting investment in our region. India is the largest and one of the fastest growing countries of the world at the moment. So is Bangladesh and the whole region is really growing together. Both have made significant progress in terms of social as well as economic indicators and enhanced resilience of the respective economies really make us so proud. You know, the global uh, uh, observers are now recognizing the uh, pace of development of both the countries. We have challenges, but these challenges can be overcome and new opportunities can be created if we cooperate further, if we learn from each other's strategies and policies, if we learn from the success stories of both our development journeys. Hence, there is so much to gain from effective collaboration between these two neighbors. Already considered 
as the role model for neighborhood diplomacy, both countries are really coordinating their foreign policies and development policies in the international forums. So we can really move forward with those gained experiences. There is a new ecology of regional cooperation. Regional cooperation in South Asia has become more pivotal than ever in the context of the global economic crisis precipitated by the after effects of the pandemic and the fallouts of the Ukraine-Russian war. And both countries have suffered. In fact, India went into negative growth in, 20, in uh, uh, 21, 2020 and 21. You know, it, it suffered about minus 6% growth. Although Bangladesh did better, we experienced about 4% growth around that uh, uh, period when the pandemic was at its height. But India regained so fast, now is one of the best performing economies of the world. The Padma Breeze has opened new windows for cooperation between the two countries. Three more bridges have also been opened since then. You know, efforts are also there to bolster multimodal connectivity uh, through the complementaries of railways and waterways. And all these will synergize, uh, uh, in fact, greater cooperation in the transportation sector. And who doesn't know that with the well-connected transportation, you can have better trade, greater debt. The stakeholders ought to materialize the potential for regional cooperation, focusing on both India and Bangladesh, along with the imperatives of transport connectivity, which has significant implications for employment, women empowerment, and energy cooperation. In all these areas, both countries are doing quite well, faring well, and I think together we can do more. In fact, an interconnected South Asia can face global economic crisis far better. And together, India and Bangladesh, you know, if we can uh, coordinate our goals and strategies, we can do even better. It can be you know, mentioned that of the regions, total trade, intra-regional trade now accounts only for about 5%. And the ratios for the same in East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa stand to be 50% and 22% respectively. In 2016, Bimstick trade constitutes a mega share of global trade of only 3.7%. But Bimstick houses 20% of the global population, meaning that there remains enormous untapped opportunities for regional cooperation. Bimstick is a large uh, family. Uh, it may not be so easy to cultivate relationships between all the countries. But India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, these sub-region can definitely do better and can do more trade and more development. What are the current trade and investment situation are, uh, in between these two countries? Let me uh, start with the trade. In fiscal year 2021-22, Bilateral trade between India and Bangladesh was about 11 billion dollars. Bangladesh exported about 1.27 billion dollars to India, and this can be improved significantly if we can really uh, focus more. And by now, of course, Bangladesh export to India has increased. You know, we are uh, really aiming to. Uh, cross 5, five billion uh, in, in the near future. And our apparels industry, particularly, uh, uh, and also export process, in fact, agriculture processing industries 
they are all making inroads into Indian market. If we can <coughs> capture 1% of the Indian imports as our exports, we can definitely increase our export to India by 3 to 4 billion dollars. Similarly, if we can attract the Indian investment, you know, uh, which has already been happening actually, the Indian uh, uh, conglomerates, Indian entrepreneurs are already investing in Bangladesh, in electricity, and, uh, RNG governments, and uh, 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 hospitals, and many, many other areas. But there is a huge opportunity to improve it further. There is a high cost of uh, uh, connectivity, uh, uh, and that is really uh, working against the acceleration of regional integration. Uh, low level of regional connectivity means you know low trade, and this is happening because of the high tariff and non-tariff barriers and also high cost of connectivity. An unprecedented level of political will is there between the two countries and uh, if we can have supportive infrastructure uh, uh, with forward and backward linkages, we definitely can have seamless connectivity between the two countries. And transport connectivity is of course the uh, you know key here. Uh, uh, transport connectivity is one of the best uh, uh, basic requirements for further cooperation between the two countries. Uh, the regional cooperation and integration, the promotion of trade and investment uh, uh, can only be uh, you know uh, done uh, with a well-established transport network. And if we can have that transport network, we can have higher level of economic growth and social development. So, for example, we can have not only more trade, but we can have also more tourism. We can have people-to-people -people contact. We have more cultural exchanges. We can have more business-to-business, -business uh, you know, our cooperation and transport connectivity can take us far. Uh, uh, long. The importance of transport connectivity can therefore just not be over overemphasized. We have already taken some initi initiatives in terms of say BBIN, MBA, PIW, TT and uh, transit facil facilities may reduce carrying time by half or more and again resulting benefits will ultimately risk the consumers will also promote deepening value chains. Just for give you an example. So for example, you know, in Russia, you know, there is a Mohananda river and on the other side and uh, there, there is a jetty and on this side also there is, if we can just connect these two, we can avoid so much of cost of transport, you know, of our goods and services. This need to go either to Singapore or some other uh, ports to really come to Bangladesh. But again, this is only stones through distance. So that's why this cooperation is so much uh, uh, vital for deepening the supply chains between the two countries. We can learn uh, that how regional cooperation can help from ASEAN experience, you know, this uh, it's, it's a very nearby experience uh, and uh, ASEAN countries has already uh, made tremendous progr uh, progress through initiating, you in know, in infrastructures and regional, uh, uh, you know, in a trade. Uh, the first they initiated, you know, reduction in uh, intra-regional tariffs and uh, then they went for uh, you know, ASEAN Highway Network, ASEAN Open Eyes, you know, these are the connectivities on the ground and also on the air. So, and the collaboration they did, 
in terms of business incubation and telecommunication networks and ASEAN power grid, you know, uh, uh, the six cross-border connections have already been made in ASEAN region. That has created a ground for about 50 percent uh, in, a, in, a, in a trade and investment cooperation between their own countries. You know, so this lesson we can definitely learn and uh, 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 put in place in South Asia where India is at the center. You know, there is a huge, there are huge investment opportunities if we really uh, play the card uh, well. India is a growing investor in Bangladesh. You know, the Indians have already invested about, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 $3 billion in terms of special economic zones in Mangla, uh, Baramara and Mirasorai. And uh, uh, if these are in place, you know, uh, the Bangladesh companies uh, 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 along with the Indian companies can really flourish. In addition, Bangladesh uh, companies can also invest in Northeast India uh, and already there is a huge cooperation of you know, agro processing in trade in, in between Northeast India and Bangladesh and we can further deepen the value chains and this will benefit both Bangladesh and Northeast India. Indeed, we can really uh, form the entire uh, border into a free economic zone if we like actually with a given kind of cooperation between the two countries. Let me give you some examples about the regional cooperation in terms of energy cooperation. We are already benefiting from the huge goodwill of economic cooperation between the two countries. We now we are uh, exporting about 1160 megawatt of electricity from India. We are now going to open a pipeline for the uh, a diesel pipeline from India. And again, uh, 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 if we can really uh, cooperate further, you know, Bangladesh can be the power corridor to link Arunachal province with the rest of India. Uh, energy trade enhancements may result in the creation of a BBI and power market in future where we can put in a bring in uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Nepal and, and Saudi, uh, you know, Bhutan uh, into this uh, 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 cooperation landscape. You know, in the transport cooperation also, we need to be multimodal. It's not only the roads, nor the railways, or the waterways, you know. We need to be, you know, equally cooperative in all the, you know, in our modes. So multimodal connectivity uh, could be emphasized uh, uh, while talking about uh, Indo-Bangladesh uh, uh, cooperation. Multimodal connectivity enhances reliance, you know, and uh, uh, reliance and sustainability of the trade relationship. Uh, amid the pandemic-induced lockdowns, Indo-Bangladesh road transportation was literally stopped. But the trade didn't stop. In fact, but trade between the two countries continued because we could fall back on the, you know, railways and the waterways. That's why, you know, uh, we need to go multimodal. Uh, the road and the rail connectivity already uh, uh, is uh, 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 on uh, and we got to rest and now operationalize BBI and MBA and uh, this will really take the relationship further. We have already established this Moitri Shetu and this is connecting Tripura with Chittagong port and, and the, uh, uh, now Chittagong, uh, Ashulia uh, uh, or Chittagong uh, 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 Tripura. Now, due to this uh, in Moitri Shetu, the distance between uh, Agartala and Chittagong has come down to only 75. So the trade has become much easier using this transit through Ashulia, we can really do trade between the two countries so easily. Bangladesh has received about uh, 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 510 million US dollar loan from India for three major railway projects. However, uh, due to the bureaucratic 
in a lethargy, I would say, uh, the implementation remains low. And we got to focus on this uh, implementation mechanism. Bangladesh is planning to revitalize all pre-1965 railway connections with India and the Indian side is also equally uh, happy to join hands on this. Uh, but the England water connectivity can really be a game changer. As you all know, the waterways connectivity initiatives are already in motion. In July 2019, Indian cargo ship you know, arrived at Narangons for the first time and subsequently now ships are coming to Chittagong and goods are being trans uh, transferred from Chittagong to Agartala and other Northeast uh, Indian uh, states. But in, in addition, what is more interesting, recently the, Prime, uh, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated this Ganga uh, in a, in a, a cruise uh, uh, which will be uh, really uh, starting from, uh, which has already, uh, the, the first trip has already started from uh, Benaras uh, coming to Kolkata then to Bangladesh and, and this is uh, really bringing in a lot of foreign guests showing both India and Bangladesh and many of our uh, people will be joining this cruise someday and know each other. Waterways connectivity initiatives are already in mission, motion as I said. Uh, if adequately facilitated, waterways connectivity can reduce travel cost by 30%. Enhanced waterways connectivity can bolster you know, media uh, and small industries and, uh, and these are the industries you know, mainly led, are mainly led by women and uh, if we can really have you know, you know, <coughs> trade hubs or the industrial hubs uh, along the river banks, you know, uh, then uh, we can have lot many uh, you know, you know, you know, employment uh, for the women. Uh, development of inland waterways require new financial and technological investments focusing on infrastructures and both countries are now working on this. Bangladesh has invested a lot and as far as I know, the recent budget the, the, which the Indians have already uh, put in place uh, has given lot much emphasis on infrastructure and I hope that both Bangladesh and India can really have higher investment in infrastructures. Uh, Bangladesh has invested in trade, uh, you know, uh, transport infrastructures like, you know, Dhaka Metro Rail, Dhaka Chittagong Expressways, Padma Bridge, Matarbari Bridge, and all these will really benefit about one third of our population. And Bangladesh is planning to have 12 gigawatt hour of additional electricity generation and again 75 billion of US dollars in, in export, 5 billion uh, value of ICT industries and here Bangladesh by 2026 and by this time and uh, with, with the help from the India we can do far better in terms of uh, you know expanding our exports. Not only in trade or infrastructure cooperation, we can really cooperate better in our social sectors as well, and that will really lead to better economic cooperation. Uh, we already have strong political will for economic cooperation uh, between the two countries, and this collaboration must be extended to social infrastructures like health, education. Already, there are some uh, good cooperation going on. You know, Delhi Public School is in Dhaka. You know, the hospital, we have uh, uh, connections in the hospital industries. We have, uh, in fact, we can, if we can have better social services, uh, 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 then we can have skilled employment and uh, reliable customer base if we can make that relationship. In fact, our Prime Minister has also uh, emphasized on collaboration in education sector. Uh, in one of our speeches on 7 September uh, 2022, uh, our Prime Minister said, youths of both countries need to interact more closely and connect to the shared history because they are the future leaders and leaders 
across borders must work in close collaboration as our leaders did in the past. So there is a political uh, will. And Bangladesh, you know, uh, as of today, we spend not much in our you know, you know, <coughs> educational sector, both countries, but India does better than us, particularly in the tertiary sector, uh, the Indian uh, really spend about 49% of their education budget. Uh, Bangladesh spends only about 30%. So we can take advantage, if we can do it, you know, uh, some more reforms, learning from each other, both countries can learn from each other and make uh, reform initiatives successful. But we can definitely benefit from the, uh, you know, uh, cooperation. Uh, on uh, educational collaboration. Both countries want to bring their respective education sector stakeholders under one umbrella. Each can learn from the experience of the other. Bangladesh is in a, in a is poised to mimic the growth path of Southeast Asian economies. And if they can do that, they will have to ensure higher education for about 36% of their population. India's success in you know, education, particularly in technical education and privately owned universities, can be replicated in Bangladesh as well. Both countries are investing significantly in research and development. Bangladesh experience in agricultural research and technological development and India's experience in ICT are both commendable models for the rest of the world. In enough scope of mutual learning and joint ventures can be really achieved in these sectors. E-learning and blended learning are becoming increasingly prominent. Bangladesh has newly uh, uh, emerging digital education startups. India has more experience in the field of distance learning and digital learning. So we can learn from each other on that as well. Special quota for Bangladesh students uh, in professional universities like the Indian Maritime University and world-class technical institutes like NI, IT uh, uh, with scholarships can be really uh, a framework uh, 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 with the Indo-Bangladesh cooperation. And uh, similarly, the existing interdependence for healthcare can be further strengthened. In fact, uh, Deepak Shukla, CEO of Pushtapoti uh, 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 Research and uh, Institute, Delhi said that medical tourism in India is increasing as the latest technologies and expo expert workforce are available here. All the medical tourists in India, 22% are from Bangladesh. So that is so we can have more cooperation in this sector so that we can really you know, substitute some of our really import. Uh, the, uh, more than two-thirds of Bangladesh's experience expenditure are borne by the citizens. Uh, more over 600 to 700,000 people travel to India for health care annually and these people spend approximately Bangladeshi taka in you know, a 50 billion to procure health care in India. Hence, Bangladesh can be a good investment destination for Indian health care providers. More scope of using digital health consultation uh, before admitting senior patients in Indian hospitals can be also thought out. That in turn may contribute towards reducing health expenditure for uh, service uh, seekers from Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh success in enhancing access to rural health care can also be a lesson for all including India. Uh, as you all know, uh, Bangladesh success in reducing uh, uh, maternal mortality rate, uh, uh, infant mortality rate uh, have been possible due to immunization program, successful immunization program and managing COVID-19 so brilliantly. These are exemplary examples. Uh, establishing community clinics at the grassroots has revolutionized rural health care. NGOs have also played a complementary role here. But Bangladesh you know, is benefiting also from some of the NGOs in India uh, to really uh, 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 take advantage of this cooperation. Bangladesh is another good example of uh, primary health services. You know, Bangladesh has established community clinics at the grassroots and almost revolutionized the primary health care center. 
in a uh, uh, system. Uh, and uh, uh, Bangladesh is also enjoying the presence of a huge number of NGOs like BRAC. You know, those are the NGOs, you know, these are, you know, you know very large NGOs and they are uh, really working on the ground. And together, uh, the government and the NGOs are really playing a very important role in primary health. So we can learn from their lessons from the Bangladesh can help the rest of the uh, South Asia definitely on this, uh, particularly uh, our neighbors. Uh, there is a, where are the possible areas of cooperation in the health sector workforce? Uh, nearly 47% of the doctor's positions and 31% of the technologist position in Bangladesh remain vacant. So uh, we can have uh, uh, help from, from our Indian uh, you know, experts to carry the necessary training and uh, workshops so that we, our doctors can really come forward to fill up these uh, places. Uh, filling out these positions could significantly reduce, reduce out-of-pocket health expenditures for our citizens. Indo-Bangladesh collaboration to train healthcare professionals can be a win-win solution for both the countries. And again, Bangladesh said growth uh, in, uh, 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 can be further uh, augmented if we can increase Indo-Bangladesh trade and investment. Uh, as I have already said, Bangladesh uh, could mimic the growth path of Southeast Asian peers and reach a you know, per capita income of 4,000 US dollars as early as 2026. And this per capita income uh, uh, could really take the Bangladesh to the same trajectory of growth as happened to Singapore, uh, Thailand, or uh, you know, Malaysia in the in the 90s and 80s so i thought this is an area where bangladesh is progressing so well consumption already constitutes 73 percent of the gdp of bangladesh likely to this is likely to grow by more than 12 percent by 2026 and about one third of the population of bangladesh will belong to the middle income group by 2026 approximately 11% will graduate from lower income to higher income group or the middle income group. By 2026, around 36% of the population will have tertiary education and will have higher disposable income. And that will really create a lot of market for the uh, you know, middle and the advanced consumers and where Indian uh, you know, entrepreneurs can come in and really do a lot of business and, and uh, industries. So opportunities are huge. Both countries have in a, in a growing consumer basis, collaboration will enhance competitiveness and growth of the industries in this consumer you know, uh, uh, sectors. Uh, India's vibrant IT, healthcare, education sector can utilize the tech-savvy, youthful human resources of Bangladesh and have the uh, you know, growth of their uh, uh, joint ventures or, or their enterprises. We have now about, uh, you know, we are, we are having about 100 uh, special economic zones in Bangladesh. Three of them are Indians. So we want lot many you know, investment in those special economic zones. Agricultural value chain developments, for example, Pran Group or the ACI are already doing very good business in India and this really can be uh, enhanced you know, if we can cooperate. The ways forward, uh, the potential for cooperation for foster and sustainable economic growth is simply unlimited, sky is the limit. Both countries are now politically poised to develop the infrastructures for desired level of cooperation. Together, the two countries can certainly move ahead with caution and, and humility. People to people, business to business, government to business, government to government, heart to heart, cooperation can yield additional mutual benefits for both the countries. And we are really looking forward to that vibrant uh, cooperation between the two countries. Thank you again for bearing with me. Thank you so much. Such a subject unlocking keynote it was.
thank you so much sir uh, to understand the finance based relation between india and bangladesh your speech is so valuable you focused on the historical economic area cooperation sector such as energy cooperation and uh, this is this uh, these under uh, make to uh, so easy to understand the fact your constructive words are so enriched for us thank you once again our first session theme is shared values of socio economic growth boosting for prosperity and now with us here is our honorable chairperson professor mezba kamal please welcome sir we are eager to hear you uh, before that uh, i want to take a chance to introduce our esteemed guest <clears throat> dr mezba kamal professor of history in university of dhaka bangladesh is an expert on diversity plurality and marginality issues and has authored or edited 23 books and numerous research articles on indigenous and dalit untouchable population peasant and trade union movements secularism and cultural studies bangladesh liberation war and south and southeast asian regional and sub regional cooperation he has also conducted more than 40 surveys for host of un and internal agencies he is currently serving as the chair of the government expert committee for identification and enlistment of marginal peoples and communities of bangladesh professor mezba kamal is an internally known human rights defender and currently serving as a technorant member and coordinator of the parliamentary caucus on indigenous peoples he is also the chairperson of research and development collective a uh, leading research and policy advocacy institute in bangladesh and was the founder general secretary of bangladesh history congress bangladesh itihas shamilani he is also a member of the human rights community commission formed by the international union of anthropological and ethnological sciences he is also a media personality reputed for his politico social analysis on contemporary bangladesh and south and uh coordinator of parliamentary caucus on indigenous people he is also the chairperson of research and development collective rdc a leading research and policy advocacy institute in bangladesh and was the founder general secretary of bangladesh history congress bangladesh itihas shamilani he is also a member of the human rights commission formed by the international union of anthropological and ethnological sciences iuaes he is also a media personality reputed for his politico social analysis on contemporary bangladesh and south and southeast asian affairs professor mezba kamal has also served bbc world service as a news producer and broadcaster in late late 1980s and early 1990s uh, he has also published and edited monthly journal samaj chetana social awareness for more than a decade He is currently the president of Jana Itihas Charcha Kendra based in University of Dhaka and of Bortola a performance space welcome sir once again and uh, now we are so much eager to hear your words your valuable words please welcome sir very good don't thank you sir you are muted sir okay uh, uh i suppose you can hear me now yes sir okay Please. thank you very much thank you very much and thanks for this uh, generous introduction uh, however i i'm very sorry and i beg your apologies uh, for being late in joining 
I had an unavoidable meeting. However, uh, I just had the opportunity to listen to uh, Professor Atiyu Rahman. Uh, he is a fantastic scholar and a very well-known academician, as well as, as you all know by this time, that he was the governor uh, of Bangladesh Bank, a very distinguished economist of our country. Uh, and I have missed the others. But can I just uh, ask you that, uh, are we approaching the end of the program or we have some other you know, presentations to be made? No, sir. We just started the uh, first session. Okay. okay. Uh, our keynote, uh, we just uh, completed our keynote address only. We just, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. So uh, maybe I'll uh, try to reflect um, on the presentations at a later stage. Uh, can we proceed with the next speaker? Yes, sir. Okay, so please proceed with the next speaker. So, uh, with the kind permission of our chairperson, uh, we are uh, uh, just uh, start our next uh, speech. Uh, and uh, now, uh, please welcome our esteemed resource person, Shushobhan Mukherjee, Chairman, uh, Infosec Foundation. Before Sir start uh, her, uh, his speech, I want to introduce uh, about him, Mr. Shushobhan Mukherjee, Chairman, Infosec Foundation, CEO, Prime Infoserv LLP, has 20 years of experience in IT consulting process and corporate relationship. A cybersecurity practitioner and design architect since his hint with all major telecom or IT operators like Tata, Airtel, CP in India. For last eight years, he has been an entrepreneur and institution builder. He is the co-founder and CEO of Prime InfoServ LLP, one of the leading technology integrator and InfoServ consulting ecosystem in India, working with Indian and global brands. Besides, he is the chairman of InfoSec uh, Foundation, a non-profit initiative to cyber awareness across the globe. He took the message and mission of Infosys Foundation in India, Bangladesh, Africa, and UK. He is committed to the cause of information security and will continue this campaign of defense, offense, and proactive and primitive protection with your cooperation and support. So please welcome, sir, once again, Mr. Shushobhan Mukherjee. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for organizing this event. Uh, so, I'll put my screen also in the distance. Um, my screen is visible? Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you very much. So, I was carefully listening for last almost an hour. So, I was initially listening uh, Mr. Prabir, then Sir Rijwan, then Dr. Atir Rahman. So, Fundamentally, the theme of today's uh, uh, event, which is a 50 hours of uh, collaborative efforts between Indo and India and Bangladesh, that has been wonderfully, context has been set. So already it has been quite understood, uh, India and Bangladesh, uh, due to various reasons, due to uh, geographically near proximity, due to cultural language kind of things, and more precisely, Bangladesh and West Bengal being a, almost in the same culture, same language. So the bonding and the relationship is much stronger. And fundamentally in today's session, what I have to talk for next 10-15 minutes, as we are talking on emerging uh, challenges, and my uh, topic and the theme is on cyber security. But as you can see, and you have heard from uh, Dr. Atir Rahman also, like the since we are talking about cyber security, so definitely we will be talking on digital communications. We are talking on connectivity. And fundamentally, if you can have seen the latest news, 
which was around uh, two days back. So uh, one of the um, leading data center provider from India, they have signed up a contract in Bangladesh for the data center ex expansion. So digital uh, Bangladesh is having a lot of interesting thoughts and strategies, which is uh, having a lot of synergies and a lot of collaboration with India. Last year, I remember this time, uh, there was a... Uh, uh, Honorable Minister Junaid Ahmad Prolok, he came to India with the uh, for signing MOU with the SART and a lot of events has happened. And I remember in the month of March, there was a session in Tripura where a lot of uh, entrepreneurs from the Indian context and Bangladesh also joined. So fundamentally, in digital Bangladesh vision, India and Bangladesh already working hand in hand. And the companies like us, my, my company, which I run on cyber security is one of the examples how we are already working hand in hand to synergize ourselves and take the mission further to our further bonding. These are the few of the examples which we are doing already in Bangladesh. These are the few uh, customers or few of the enter enterprises where we are, we are already working on the cyber security. So fundamentally, as you know, today's topic, so we are drilling down further for in cyber security domain. So is it that we are looking for one more incident, one more attack to before we respond? I think many of you available here, you are aware of one of the largest uh, bank uh, haste in uh, 2016 in Bangladesh. So similar, not only in Bangladesh, India and across the globe, are we waiting for one more incident to happen before we have our response strategies? So that is the fundamentally our session theme today. So initial few slides, we will be tr trying to talk about the present context. So as you can very well understand, India and Bangladesh almost in the almost same digital transformation journey, the context for India and Bangladesh is almost same. So definitely the consequences, the strategies, the mission and vision, it will be almost same. So from that background, the uh, next 10, 15 minutes, we have divided into two, three parts. First of all, we'll be trying to set the context on the digital transformation era, how it is impactful. And then we'll try to also put up certain points in these situations, what exactly we should do, both in India and Bangladesh. And definitely, accordingly, our synergies will be much more strengthened in those terms. So fundamentally, as you, we all understand, we are in a uh, data-driven economy in our digital transformation journey. And the situations like COVID, this kind of pandemic, this has further strengthen the same. That means we are forced to uh, do the, go ahead with this digital disruption, even if many of the situations where it was not planned, we are not ready. But fundamentally, even after that, now the situation is like that. So it is, uh, we always keep on saying data is our new fuel. It is not only fuel, fuel, money, land, whatever you talk about, data is our everything. Without the data, without our digital transformation journey, we cannot live at this moment. Like at this moment, today we are all attending this session through a webinar format. If digital, uh, this pandemic or this kind of disruption would not have been happened, then we might have uh, been visiting through a physical kind of a auditorium and delivered this kind of lectures. So fundamentally in everything in our life, so all digital is coming to our home. We are no longer going to banks. We are not no longer going to restaurants. So we are bringing all our services to our home. So that is the kind of disruption it has happened and it has impacted our life. And moment this has happened, so you can very well understand this is a very interesting uh, image available in Google. So moment we are part of this digital transformation journey, definitely there are a lot of consequences are bound to happen. So which are definitely threats or attacks. Now you can see, starting from 2018 to till, till if we um, focus on a span of 2027, you can very well see the rise of cyber threats or cyber crimes are rapidly increasing. And these are few of the emerging threat indicators. You, many of you have, might have heard like phishing, man in the middle attack, DDoS kind of situation, malware, sophisticated malware. Ransomware attack, a lot of data are getting by Advanced persistent threat, DNS kind of attack kind of situations. Every situation thing is happening like many of us keep on thinking we have all the security measures, we have all the strategies in place, but someone 
is digging the hole and uh, taking all my crowns and jewels. So it is like a Tom and Jerry kind of story. So always someone of like us, all the enterprises, government, we are thinking everything is safe at my side. Nothing can happen. But we are only it, 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 we are only gaining the light once something has already happened, like some data is already exposed. Like many of you might be knowing about Singapore health incidents. What has happened? Even the minister's data was also uh, published in the dark web. Like we have done uh, one of the leading uh, energy sector power utility company. I cannot name it due to NDA. I, uh, so we found the entire plant design, even entire the Oracle database is exposed to a dark web. One of the leading defense organization in the um, global sector, Europe and US, we have seen their 100% data is available in dark web. People are not even aware of it. So that is the kind of situation we are into. So uh, fundamentally, the uh, challenge is uh, moment we are into a digital disruption, we are digital transformation journey. Threats are becoming much more complex. We are we are adopting new and new te new te technologies, which is uh, in and around IT, and definitely our attack services are getting much more complex, and definitely our our life, our consequences will be much more complex as well. So these are the, uh, this year, once we have started this uh, new uh, calendar year, we have done a study and we captured, you can see, every 19, uh, 39 seconds there is a cyber attack. And in 90% of the cyber threats are coming from phishing. So these are few of the scary statistics. So our life is in a kind of a complex state where unless we are cautious, unless we are having our precautionary measures now, we cannot sustain in our personal life, in our professional life, in our enterprise, in our government, in our nation, across the globe, there's a situation is a kind of a war situation. So unless we are proactive, unless we are having our best practices, our strategies in, is in place now, ultimately we cannot avoid, uh, stay away from that war. So these are the few incidences I will not read through. I have written the uh, presentation in such a format so that post uh, the event, if you share it, so many of you can refer is also for further reference. You might have, you might be knowing many of the incidences. So like starting from Oil India to Facebook, Microsoft, uh, even uh, Ames and uh, Google and Indian Railway, various kind of incidences it is taken from India and global. Uh, I will not read through, but you can very well see none of the sectors are untouched. Like if there are banks, there are e-commerce platforms, there are um, education platforms, there are telecoms. Every every industry is are, are almost affected. And these are the few of the uh, examples from Bangladesh. So you can very well see India and Bangladesh are maybe in a global impact per se. So we are not staying apart. So situations are almost same. So if we are facing the similar kind of challenges, so and definitely the strategies will also be similar. So in that context, Bangladesh is little ahead because we are we are already having digital Bangladesh in place. So in that context, Bangladesh ICT this division, A2I, and many of them they are creating a lot of strategies. So so that uh, we can have uh, our 2025 by 2025, if we can have uh, our better. A synchronization. So right hand side it, it is written in Bengali because uh, I found this one in from one of the uh, uh, newspaper in Bangladesh only. So they have said around 36 percent uh, situations are having uh, problem due to technology adoption. So we need to be proactive and otherwise we cannot avoid the consequences. So since I have started with the Bangladesh Bank kind of haste, we can see Bangladesh Bank as a, being a regulatory body, they are trying a lot of things since 2016 itself. They are adopting, they are changing, they are suggesting a lot of, uh, lot of things so that uh, typically banking and financial sectors in Bangladesh, they can have their proactive measures. But problem is that so cyber security being a vast subject, there are so many different kinds of things and handling all the things together for an enterprise and for an individual or by a professional or by an organization or a government is extremely difficult because you can very well see in the screen, in the screen I have captured in one of the mind map, so many different kinds of subjects to be dealt once we are talking of a cybersecurity domains. But fundamental problem in across the globe is 
every one of us are, of us in enterprise smb or government we are always trying to prevent a breach but so we are thinking we will take certain measures so that hackers will not come to my landscape my data will be secure but that is the fundamental mistakes we are doing not only in india and bangladesh but across the globe that means you cannot protect your crown and jewels from a hacker because you cannot um, close your doors and windows and say hacker will not come because hacker will find his own way and it will come from a different route so we need to have a fundamentally a mechanism so that even if hacker comes to my premises i'll be having my checks and balances so that i can at least understand yes hacker has arrived to my landscape now i need to have some measures so that my further consequences which is exposure of my data or encryption of my data that should not happen so fundamentally that is called detection so if we can detect some hacker has come to my landscape some malicious traffic is going on and i can take certain uh, certain measures so that my data doesn't get breached typically this is a 180 days to 205 days kind of time frame by that time we, we are the, uh, the activities got unnoticed means hacker has come to my network he is uh, silently deciding taking out certain data observing the patterns and the behaviors and then he will um, decide his strategy by that time it is completely unnoticed so here it is coming uh, taking into the coming into the light after 205 days once the data is out so i have given three examples in every uh, example in the across industries almost like sen we are only coming to know once data is encrypted data is found in the dark web or somebody is asking ransomware or something so that means our entire approach is reactive we are always thinking we have taken measures nothing will happen to my landscape everything uh, is safe and secured but uh, with that thought process we are not able to take proactive measures fundamentally situation is like that breaches are inevitable so you cannot do something if some technology process or tools uh with the some oem or something you cannot have certain uh, landscape where there will be no breaches moment we can align our mindset towards the philosophy breaches are inevitable our life will become easier we can uh, look towards the landscape towards the situation in much more open mind and decide our strategies so one is uh, breaches are inevitable and problem is that our our landscape is also heterogeneous my, my means many of us who are in the into the enterprise or organ running organization running governments we have many different devices in our landscape we have laptop desktops we have server router switches firewall many applications all those different devices are creating so many different kind of alerts and as a as a it administrator or a security administrator analyzing all those kind of alerts many of them will be false positive it will create alert fatigues and moment moment my landscape is heterogeneous i have so many different kind of elements analyzing all the different kind of logs from so many different kind of devices it is very time consuming so once we are analyzing the logs and coming to a decision by that time some consequences has happened so i was attending on seminar there one of the leading oem they said we have only 2 hours of time from for, for a sophisticated malware attack means once the malware attack has arrived to my landscape if i cannot take any action by 2 hours it is gone beyond my control and they were committing they will be doing certain things in one um, hour 38 minutes but fundamentally if we cannot do things early we will be having lesser chance to protect our crown and jewels and definitely other problems like contextual limitation there are huge volume of logs there are different kind of isolated point products like suppose in our landscape we have antivirus we have firewall we have mail security we have uh, sandboxing we have web application firewall so many different things like dlp uba sim what not so if in a landscape i have 30 different point products how will be one is huge volume of logs one is i have limited time i don't have the contextual information of the knowledge so that i can decide and we have so many different kind of devices which can protect my landscape but actually if i have, i have to protect my landscape using those point products 
I have to configure, I have to analyze, I have to write policies, then only it can perform, right? So ultimately, it is very difficult to handle it humanly. And as you can see, right, the last point I mentioned, it is it takes around four plus kind of days. Sometimes it is even it is month to analyze and come to a root cause analysis. What consequences? What why this mal? Um, uh, what are the malicious traffic and what exactly has happened so that I will take my counter measures. So by that time, everything is gone. So okay. this is the situation you can see. So, so many alerts are coming, very different kind of processes. There are repetitive manual actions. There are no interconnectivity and integrated approach. So fundamentally, problem is... Uh, with so many different kind of alerts, we are not able to take decisive action so that I can have my better incident response. So what we should do? So this is a right hand side, a pictorial diagram of a uh, saying. Uh, can, can I just can I just come in? Pardon me, uh, Mr. Shushavan Mukherjee. Yes. Uh, thank. Uh, please kindly wind up because we have three more speakers after you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm also in the Thank last you. moment only, maybe a couple yeah. of couple yeah. more sides. I'm just concluding. Please conclude. Please conclude. Yeah. So fundamentally, what should be our plan? So we need to do a risk assessment. We need to have our proactive information security strategy. We need to have our preventive controls and processes. We need to do a proactive monitoring so, so that we can have an automated response to handle this kind of incidences. So this is the key philosophy as we are shortage of time. I'm not going to explain this. So fundamentally, we need to ask all of us to a question. Are we compromised? Are we are sufficient enough to be resilient? So it is like similar like cyber uh, COVID situations. Like many of us could not sustain due to com comorbidity and other situation. None of the medicines was also working. So fundamentally, who survived, they worked on their immunity. Like doctors also prescribe vitamins and other things. The same is applicable for even our cyber security landscape. Moment we have a cyber immunity approach in hand, we can definitely become resilient and handle our landscape in a better mode. So that's all. So I think uh, who are we are, we are not explaining. As we, I have started and Rijuan also said, there is always a bilateral uh, kind of a agreement. Some uh, cross propagation is happening. So it, interestingly, I'm also visiting tomorrow to Bangladesh. On a delegation, I'll be there for four or five days. I think I'll be able to meet many of you who are present also in this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for, for patience here. Oh, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Shushavan Mukherjee. And um, he has uh, drawn our attention to the need for taking, uh, you know, necessary measures before another uh, another uh, you know uh, another big haste or some kind of uh, troubles take place uh, however um, uh, he has uh, you know drawn our attention to the reality that you know cyber security has become a problem or is becoming increasingly more problematic and uh, there is a strong need for taking necessary action now and particularly in the context of Bangladesh when uh, we are moving forward from digital Bangladesh to smart Bangladesh the need is much more nowadays as it is in other parts of the world including India. However, thank you very much and uh, let us uh, proceed to the next speaker and I would request uh, our I would request um, uh, Gitoshmita Dash to kindly make her presentation and also request uh, Ms. Deptoshi Mistro Chodri to kindly introduce Ms. Gitoshmita Dash. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Gitoshmita Dash, MPIL, Research Scholar, Department of Peace and Conflict Studies and Management, Sikkim University, hometown Patshala, Asham. Uh, her title is Border Hats as, as a Hub of Socio-Economic Growth between India and Bangladesh. Please welcome Gitosh Dash. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, you are. 
ओके थैंक यू Is it visible to everyone? Yes. Okay. Okay. So good afternoon to all the eminent speakers, and thank you very much to Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for organizing such a wonderful session. Already, the previous two speakers has addressed today's theme in very detail. So I will be talking. on border hut that how the border hut between india and bangladesh have built a bridge between people of the border for their socio economic development uh, as we all know india and bangladesh sharing their longest border among all the neighboring countries india shares a 4096 km border with bangladesh Including West Bengal, 2,216.7 km; Assam, 263 km; Meghalaya, 443 km; Tripura, 856 km; and Mizoram, 318 km. And both of these countries sharing many commonalities, including sharing water, cultural heritage, and all forms of connectivity through waterways, railways, roadways, and airways. Uh, both of these countries have also sharing the people to people trade uh, through this border had actually uh, both countries were signed the, uh, their first one year trade agreement on march 28 1972 as part of the treaty of friendship cooperation and peace this agreement was considered a landmark of mutual benefit among india and bangladesh and a uh, desire to promote people to people trade based on understanding and friendship but this agreement was not fulfilled due to some technicalities and illegal trade were flowing across the border between india and bangladesh and people of the border have faced insecurity and conflicting situation because of black marketing smuggling as we all know uh, after a long awaited the historic historic agreement uh, between uh, ministry of india and the ministry of bangladesh have been signed on 23rd october 2010 for establishment of border hut which revive people to people trade practices throughout the border of 5 km distance which was scrapped after the partition so uh, what is hut is uh, as you all know hut is an indigenous town that means bazar one can identify it in rural areas it is an area within and around local communities where people of different villages uh, visit for buying and selling their items local produce items uh. so uh, the idea of border hut uh, the border huts are small local markets established uh, along the international boundary the zero point of two countries Uh, uh for developing the border regions in particular and holding the strong political economic and socio cultural cultural ties between the two countries for general purposes keeping the importance of border hut for the ease of life and welfare of the people at india bangladesh border on 23rd of october 2010 the memorandum of understanding has been signed between indian prime minister dr manmohan singh and Uh, prime minister of bangladesh h c sheikh hasina additionally mode of operation also signed by commerce ministry of india and bangladesh jointly on 2012 permitting such daily commodities following this agreement four border huts has been established between india and bangladesh two in tripura namely srinagar sagalnaya border hut and kamal sagar tarapur border hut both of these border huts started functioning from 2015 and another two border huts are in meghalaya border meghalaya uh, uh, kalaishar kalaishar baliamari border hut and balat dalora border hut balat is from the indian side and dalora is from the bangladesh side uh, both of these border hut has been opened in 2012 these border huts are around 5625 square meter areas all uh, four these functional border huts works uh, weekly basis from 10 to uh, 3 pm it has 98 km distance from silang uh, 
in the balad border hat according to the memorandum of understanding border hat has one entry and exit point indian people should be enter from indian side and bangladesh people uh, from their uh, side respectively hat is managed by a border hat management committee along with security officials custom officials and common people of the villages at one time 50 vendors from each side have been uh, given license for one year and they can enter through rotation basis from 1 to 25 with their photo identity cards in a particular day so there are uh, there are some uh, pictures i have taken uh, when i was visited in the border hut uh, this is the uh, meghalayan side uh, from the indian side this is these are the vehicles that people have used to uh, take their products in the uh, border hut so why this study is important that india and bangladesh border is well known for various smuggling activities uh, and black marketing marketing and local peoples are also engaged in these incidents such practices are appearing as a violation of international border ethics when uh, between india and bangladesh as well as the essence of peace such practices are also overriding and complicating the flow of necessary goods and ethical means at the border of india and bangladesh therefore promoting peace in the border region is nonetheless a very crucial task as the border is a strategic point which most of the time promotes conflicting activities and india and bangladesh border it is prominent for such illegal economic activities so to reverse those issues people to people trade through border hut can be a prospect for the future relation between both the countries and well being of the local people this kind of problem has not yet been discussed in the academic research uh, many of the academic research have discussed also so the problems and future prospects of these border huts uh, are Uh, this establishing border huts can be reduce conflict and can build friendly cooperation between the both uh, both these counterparts uh, secondly this borderland people have growing demands for com- commodities that are restricted in the formal border hut and because of that lots of silent flow of illegal goods are going on the functioning role of this border huts between india and bangladesh and problems arising because of Uh, mafia politics going on from the bangladesh side also from the indian side it has been noticed uh, that there are some high profile businessmen involved in the functions of these border huts who decide the vendors to enter into the hut from their side only and the favor on border hut is mostly from the indian side only due to because of fear of flourishing flourishing indian goods in the bangladeshi domestic market they do not willing to get more border huts so there is uh, this is the main problem actually bangladesh vendors also uh, reluctant reluctant to do work in border huts because of the megaly populated indian side they are not earning much profit and there is a problem regarding a 5 km radius of people only taking part as vendors mm-hmm. also okay. lack of feminine lack uh, of feminine and since uh, i apologize since we are running short of time please try to wind up yes wind sir, up. yes yes hmm. yeah please please conclude yes sir, yes Okay, so thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I didn't want to stop you right now. You can take a minute to wind up. Huh? Yes, sir. It's okay, sir. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no problem, sir. I I was about to end actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, okay, Gitashmita. Okay. Thank you very much. You have. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, you have. Uh, taken up a very important subject as your uh, you know paper um, 
in fact um, you know the local economy and the well-being of the local people uh, has been at the center of your paper and uh, since uh, we know that the border has been created uh, somewhat artificially um, because of some historical reasons you know uh, there has i mean it is evident that Uh, there is a distinct border economy and there is an local need for the products that are locally produced or available and across the borders so in fact uh, if we don't want to look at the well-being of the local people and want to impose certain uh, laws then it will only criminalize the people Uh, without looking into the actual need of the people living in both sides of the border so the border economy uh, the the essence of the border economy has to be understood and that's why you know um, you know uh, you know this particular point that you have been focusing uh, the um, the from the creation of these border huts is an, is a very important subject and this people to people trade is really important for the improvement of relations between the um, between the local peoples across the borders also uh, the relationship between the bordering countries thank you very much agitoshmi thank you very much sir thank you yeah thank you very much uh, the, uh, our next speaker will be Ms. Shefalika Ghosh, and I would also request Bhutoshi to kindly introduce Shefalika. Shefalika Ghosh Swamadhar, Professor, Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Dr. Shudhi Chandu Shud Institute of Technology and Sports Complex, Kolkata. Please welcome, Madam. And uh, the topic of her is trending Indo-Bangladesh trade and business cooperation. through a common socio economic tool a geographical indications perspective please welcome madam Good afternoon. Um, myself, Shefalika Gosawadal, and my co-author, Ashia Khatun, <coughs> will be presenting on the strengthening Indo-Bangladesh trade and business cooperation to common socio-economic tool, uh, a geographical indication perspective. So uh, this is related to we have we have uh, we are cutting short on the. Um, statistics and uh, how it had uh, come over here instead of uh, cutting that uh, just presenting on this uh, particular uh, perspective that is a geographical indication perspective so to start with um, we have so much that we have common ancestral history and uh, this is divided into three parts one is your 
pre-war days, before 1971, and that is also divided into two parts, pre-independence when we all together were under colonial rule, and it was uh, governed by the uh, sporadic in incidences of the Hindu Muslim diet, which was politically introduced in those days, but the common fabric was the same. Later on, after independence, there was India-Pakistan relationship between the East Pakistan and the West Pakistan. Even in spite of that, the cultural tie between the West Bengal and the then East Pakistan was more or less intact. Other than some kind of the uh, incidents that were introduced by war and uh, some kind of the crime introduced uh, due to the war. Later on, after 1971, the Neo-Indo-Bangladesh bilateral relationship was based on the respect for the war of liberation. And that was the turning point. And after this, the, we shared our age-old shared tradition, culture, similarity of the culture and expression, and whatnot. So trade and business that were flourished on the basis of the communities in every aspect of life of the nation, both the nations. Now there is boost in connectivity through uh, various ways. There is open um, uh, opening of the border uh, areas and connection through the railways, waterways, roadways, uh, airways as well. And there was a new trade relation and the market creation was there. Market creation was there, which was the traditional and uh, pro traditional product line of the Bangladesh, the new Bangladesh, and also of India. Not only for the goods and the services, but also for the exchange of the expertise and man manpower in the initial days of the uh, post-war, that is 19, after 1971, post-war days. The trade involves the legal exploitation of the intellectual property rights of both the countries, and initially it was related with uh, copyright, the phonograms, movies, etc., and mainly uh, initiated with that, and later on with the product line of the fabrics, and specifically mentioned is the Jamdani sarees. <coughs> now, um, in fact, if we consider that the trade relation, there are intellectual property rights that govern each and every trade relation. Our paper attempts to look at <laughs> trade relation, <laughs> bilateral and multilateral treaties between the <coughs> of India and uh, Bangladesh, and also the South Asian region, uh, exploiting typically one of the IPRs we are talking about, and that is geographical indications. And these geographical indications, if we go by the definition, it is related to the geographical location and the expertise, skills, and the other things which are specifically related to the particular geographical relation and due to some condition of the geography of the region. Now, if we consider the geography of the region, it is more or less common. Uh, West Bengal and uh, Bangladesh, they share the border and it was earlier one common region. So naturally the product lines that were uh, there, uh, the initial, that flourished and that um, that has both the uh, both, uh, both the both the repercussion of changes over a period of time. Now uh, the geographical indications which uh, considers the geographical locations, and because India had the rules framed under the PIPS agreement and uh, governed by a number of the various WIPO treaty, so India is the first comer. Now, India is the first comer, so naturally the common uh, elements of expertise, skill, and the traditional uh, element that was protected in India, protected in India by the uh, appropriate geographical indication act, which was framed earlier than the Bangladesh. Bangladesh geographical indication act was framed later in the period 2013. By that time, the common elements of the common product line based on the geographical indication that were registered um, uh, in the Indian part. And that was specifically which were related to India, particularly in West Bengal and around. Now, after that, after 2013, when the policy came into there, 
there is some kind of a misconception about the GI that these, these GI, since it is protected in India, it cannot be further protected in Bangladesh, which was a totally uh, misnomer as far as the definition of the GI goes. Because the GI, as per the WIPO and as per the TIPS agreement, it, it can be protected as, far, as long as it, is, it can be related to a particular geographical location. So if a product of Jamdani is related to a particular location of Bangladesh, it can be well protected as the Bangladesh GI. And it can be the trade and the transport, the trade and the business can flourish on the basis of that. The trade-related controversies, these kind of the controversies, and there are very many uh, legal issues and the papers that these are should be uh, given back to Bangladesh. There is no question of giving back. What is uh, is appreciated uh, is that that these products are specifically uh, related to a region which belongs to Bangladesh, and therefore these products by virtue of its location, belongs to Bangladesh. Similarly, the products which are due to the location of India belongs to India only. So there is no controversy as far as the legal framework is concerned. So the, what is the solution of this controversy and the oh, uh, legal problems? The problems and the, it, is, it requires the IPR education. IPR education and also the validation on the basis of the World Intellectual Property Organization Directive that should be there. The acceptability to both the nations sharing the resources using the multilateral treaties in the other countries, like we are having the multilateral treaties related to Basmati rice uh, with India, Pakistan, and there are other countries as well. So similarly with Bangladesh, uh, related to the same product line and having the communities in the expertise and the skills that can also be accepted by both the nations. The independent identification of the goods and the services by the nations and the maintenance and the sharing of the geograph uh, geographical indication register as it is maintained in India that can also is being maintained in Bangladesh and this uh, register is required to be published time to time. So we are having the economic and the strategic cooperation. We are having the removal of the misconception regarding the legal framework of the geographical indication. Framework for the trade and the business cooperation is already in place. We are having the cultural and the educational ties, which is already established, and we require further more exchanges. A sound legal framework of the bilateral treaties with understanding is a way forward, and we are looking forward to that. And uh, also, the conclusion is that the protection of the geographical indication related traditional products and the skills that the country concerned should first recognize it for the worldwide recognition. So if the country concerned first at any point of time, whenever it is there, it is being recognized in their country, then it will be recognized worldwide. If it is not recognized in their country, then it can be infringed or there can be the fake GI that can be um, that can be prepared or that can go for the registration. And that has happened. There are a number of the case studies related to Neem, Basmati and other um, products in India when it was not registered in the GI of India, it was infringed. The Ma'am, ma'am, excuse me. Yeah, very interesting points you have been making, but please conclude. Yeah, please. So another can be opted for the GI before and after the intended GI application for registration, and that is immaterial. And even if we can have a number of uh, documentary proof that, or in the form of the steeps, folklore results of cultural study and the research that are uh, that are the ones to get are not being appreciated by their own and we can win the case as India has won a number of the cases related to the geographical indication which were infringed by the other countries. So uh, this is the conclusion this I have already explained the documentary existence of the documentary uh, proof in the form of the uh, scripts folklore or the results of the cultural study and the research, this should be preserved. 
and for any kind of the GI infringement, this can be used and the uh, basis can be owned. So, references I have not uh, kept it over here, it is given in the original research paper. And uh, this is my point and this is my conclusion. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Welcome the queries related to the topic. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Shepardika Ghosh Dostidar. Uh, in fact, you have brought in a very interesting area, and uh, you know, uh, you have correctly pointed out that uh, you know the geographical perspective from the. I mean, uh, we can look into this issue from the geographical perspective, and you know, the kind of trade and business synergy can be. Uh, promoted can be developed and uh, you know you have referred to the misconceptions and misunderstandings which arise out of this uh, you know GI issues and um, you know this can be resolved um, if we want to resolve it quickly but the trouble is this you know often uh, in this uh, subcontinent of post partition times, uh, you know, politi politi politicization of the issues takes place very easily and, uh, you know, it is used by certain political quarters to, you know, to, to um, challenge the uh, increasing uh, intimate relationship between uh, our two countries um, uh, and, and, and often you know we are talking about commonalities and often it is it is made communalized so <laughs> those problems are there but you know very well discussed thank you very much and these are issues uh, you know which can be you know resolved and controversies avoided uh, through this kind of uh, you know uh, awareness building and knowledge creation. Thank you very much, Professor Shefali Kagosh. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, our next speaker will be Mr. Rajiv Bhattacharjo, and I would request Deptoshi to kindly introduce Mr. Rajiv Bhattacharjo. Yes, sir. Dr. Rajiv Bhattacharya is an associate professor, WBESA in the Department of Economics, Goenka College of Commerce and Business Administration, Kolkata. His topic is exploring the potentials of Indo-Bangladesh trade patterns and the performance of trade indicators. Please welcome, sir, Dr. Rajiv Bhattacharya. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Please. Uh, my screen is visible? Yes, it is. Is my screen visible? Okay. Thank you. First of all, uh, respected chairperson and uh, to the... Uh, uh, I, I, I uh, um, uh, express my gratitude to the Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for uh, 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 giving me the opportunity to speak in this uh, two-day international conference. And my topic, I am directly due to a constraint, time constraint. Let me directly move on to my presentation. I will be speaking on exploring the potentials of Indo-Bangladesh trade patterns and the performance of trade indicators. Basically, it is a technical paper, but uh, for presentation purpose, I have uh, deliberately avoided this uh, technical parts and made it a technical one. And this is the uh, uh, a structure of my presentation. So, so let me go directly into the my what, what I am going to present. As we all know from the very beginning, I was listening. India and Bangladesh are the two important trading partners of the South Asian trade zone, and they are well connected by the SARC, that is the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, and the South Asian Free Trade Area, that is the SAFTA. And seven other countries of the South Asia are also related to this, apart from India. And in a globalized world, the two twin weapons which are used normally are trade liberalization and financial integration. And that two, these two weapons allow a country to participate or penetrate in the global value chain. 
and actually by implementing proper appropriate domestic policy the country can take advantage of the comparative advantages of the trade as we all know that during the covid-19 restrictions supply vulnerabilities and shocks in the disruptions that created dis uh, disruptions in the global value chain and there was a fall there was a sharp fall in the global trade and uncertainties are still prevailing because there are unpredictable nature of the us ukraine of the of the russia ukraine war this bit of key now if we if we look into india's profile of the india export and the profile you will see that analysis can be if you look into that you will find that india's export partners among the india's export partners bangladesh rank is sixth its share is only 2.9% in india india share in in the import partners among the south asian seven countries bangladesh rank is third if we look from the india's point of view in the period 16 17 to 19 20 there was steady upsurge in the total trade in the south among the south asian countries within the south asian countries and due to covid restrictions the trade fell into 2020 we already know the only exceptional country is bangladesh because and this this the, 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 in this period 2021 the, the the trade with bangladesh india's trade with bangladesh increased in in, in spite of all the covid-19 restrictions and this shows clearly the strength and the potential for trade relations between the two nations looking at the from the bangladesh's point of view this data has been collected from the bangladesh bureau of statistics you can see the bangladesh has a highest trade relation with india the volume and the value of trade relation is highest but the problem is they have a negative balance of trade that is the trade balance has been negative and it has been increasing over the years and this has been a matter of concern for the bangladesh government and if we look from the bangladesh point of view the trade the ratio of the share of trade of bangladesh with all its trading partners is again in increasing this is the pie chart which shows in compared to 2016 17 india's trade with bangladesh has increased from 34% in 2016 17 to almost 45% in 21 22 now if we look into the history of the trade uh, relations with bangladesh and the composition of trade items after the liberation liberation of pakistan in 1971 actually the bilateral trade between india and bangladesh thrived the reason is there was a demand for consumer goods especially food which used to come from india and the trade dependence developed and after the opening up of bangladesh major economic reforms were introduced in 1982 but the problem is there was an appreciation of taka to rupee exchange rate of about 50% during the period 1980 to 1999 and that uh, that resulted in a growth of export of india but it retarded the growth of export of bangladesh and several attempts were made to correct the anomalies but actually it continued to stagnate and during the 1980s bangladesh actually exported basic manufactures leather rubber paper chemicals but now it is export medicine textiles iron and steel raw jute jandani sarees medical appliances and so on and india's trade ka india's export to bangladesh comprises of food grains fabrics cotton yarn machinery instruments glass glassware ceramics and gold that these are the latest data which i have collected from un comtrade database which shows the export items along with their values of india's export to bangladesh and bangladesh export to india and i have already specified though the trade relations they have many trade relations and many treaties for example safta the bangkok agreement and the, which is a safta which is the precursor of the safta and the global trade system but the most problematic thing is that the bilateral trade imbalance which uh, bangladesh has with india is a matter of concern now let me go into the main part of my presentation which i have did in my work you can those who are interested can see the work that is based on the trade indicators i have tried to evaluate the performance of these trade relations on the basis of a few trade indicators i have used four indicators the first one is the trade openness of the country which is basically the average of the total trade as a percentage of the gdp we can see but both for for both these countries from 2012 there was a sharp downfall but the decline was much steeper in case of bangladesh than in case of india what is happening with the second indicator which is a technical one the revealed comparative advantage indicator 
which talks about the real comparative advantage is basically the ratio of a product case share in country i's export to the share of world trade and if we have rca greater than 1 it means the sector k it implies that sector in sector k in country i has a revealed comparative advantage and if it is less than 1 it is a reveal it has a revealed comparative disadvantage and the if the countries have similar profiles similar kind of rca profiles they are only li likely to have high bilateral trade intensities unless they have intra industry trade which is based on similar products and the right hand side shows the rankings the latest rankings between the rca rankings between india and bangladesh now the problem another important issue that has cropped up over the years is if we look into the last two decades 2009 2001 to 9 and 2010 to 20 we see that the number of sectors having rca greater than one has more or less remained stable but RCA uh, has improved in 47 sectors in India and RCA has declined in 44 sectors among the 91 sectors which has RCA greater than 1 but there is a technical problem of using this RCA index i'm not going to into the technicalities one is the asymmetrical so this RCA is uh, asymmetric and so we use the normalized RCA and in the normalized RCA behave the same way as the standard RCA index the only change is the critical value changes from 0 to 1 and lower bound is minus 1 and the upper bound is 1 and it is made symmetric by making it normalized if we go to the third indicator that is the trade complementarity index which is is by the world bank and this trade complementarity index as the very name suggests it shows the amount of the match the degree of complementarity between the reporting country's export profile and the import profile of its trading partner now if the tci was originally in, uh, was originally uh, introduced by micheli but it was in the case of natural trading partners but later on it was used to exemplify to evaluate the extent of the bilateral trade relations the regular i have computed the uh, trade complementarity index of india's import with that of bangladesh and uh, india's export with that of bangladesh what is the result the result is this is the latest complementarity rankings which shows that india's export basket highly is complementary with italy belgium uk brazil but their shares is very negligible compared to usa china uae hong kong and etc what is bangladesh position bangladesh tci is 56.1 which is moderately good performing but from the india's import basket india's import basket complement very well with usa singapore uk netherlands malaysia but india's import basket has a very low complementarity this is an important very important issue that means that india's import basket is a poor match to what bangladesh exports and that is that area should be looked into by the policy makers to improve the bilateral trade the last case is the trade intensity index which basically tells the share of one country's export going to a partner divided by the share of the exports going to uh, its partner so the share of world exports going to its partner so the two things here i have used that is the trade intensity index and the modified trade intensity index and these two intensity index are again in the similar fashion by the bilateral trade is larger than the expected then the index has a value greater than 1 and if it is lower than the smaller than that then the index shows a value lesser than 1 and these are the last two figures we will show due to time constraint i am skipping all those slides and hmm. what does this figure shows this professor rajiv professor rajiv uh, kindly yeah. conclude professor rajiv kindly conclude okay sir one more minute so hmm. this two figure shows the trade intensity with bangladesh and this one is for trade intensity of bangladesh uh, bangladesh trade intensity of india and this shows a very interesting issue which we, i will highlight at the end that is the measure of the extent of trade between both the countries reveal that the share of exports to bangladesh out of the world exports to bangladesh is more than expected and is significant but the share of bangladesh exports to india out of the world exports to india is less than expected and insignificant that is an important matter of concern which the policy makers has to look into and i would try to point out last lastly i would try to point out the major obstacles which has been pointed out by my earlier speakers also there is a mismatch of india's import with that of bangladesh export i have already told in the tci rankings 
the transshipment and the trans transit facilities problem, the custom clearance, the tariff and the non-tariff barriers, the informal and the illegal trade, the reluctance towards implementing trade facilitation measures, and the weak follow-up of economic ties. And the, these things are taken into account and serious uh, um, 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 efforts are being given to remove all these restrictions. I think bilateral trade between India and Bangladesh can flourish in a much, much better manner. Thank you all of you for your patient hearing. I conclude. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rajiv Bhattacharjo. And uh, uh, you have brought in very important point uh, that matters uh, in the relationship between <laughs> India and Bangladesh, these two neighboring countries. Uh, and uh, particularly, uh, you have mentioned about the India's import basket in which, you know, imports from Bangladesh stands uh, very low. Uh, that is, uh, and actually this is affecting the trade balance between the two countries and this sometimes become uh, political issues um, um, in, in our part of the world. However, uh, you know, uh, I also want to have a look um, uh, a bit differently. Um, you know, the economy, uh, the, uh, the, the overall Indian economy and the regional economy may have different uh, settings. And if we look at the trade balance between India and Northeast, between Bangladesh and Northeast India, the figure is perhaps much more positive yeah, than what it is with the rest of India. So the, uh, you know, the complementarity of this regional trade, that's, uh, I think, uh, should be highlighted and, uh, you know, maybe focused on in future planning and negotiations. So um, uh, you have rightly pointed out um, the, that uh, during even the COVID, you know, the relationship, the trade relationship between Bangladesh and India has actually increased. And, um, you know, we may have to face similar situations. Um, the Russia-Ukraine war, I don't know how much it will drag on, how long it will drag on, and it might create problems for many of the countries, including Bangladesh. And so, you know, in times of need, these, you know, um, uh, these uh, kind of, uh, you know, neighborhood relationships can be of real help to uh, any country, including India and Bangladesh. So thank you very much for your very wonderful presentation. And since I have, uh, you know, intervened into many of your speeches, I would like to beg pardon for that. But I have been advised to close it by seven, which I have failed. Uh, but I'm, I don't, myself don't want to take much time. I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, uh, I would like to thank Kolkata Society for Asian Studies for this wonderful uh, you know, uh, wonderful uh, uh, initiative, feast of 50 years of Indo-Bangladesh relationship. And uh, I just, uh, when I joined, I was listening to Professor Athiyu Rahman, who was uh, referring to uh, the medical tourism. And, you know, he was also, this is also a kind of, uh, you know, complementarity that, uh, you know, that exists. But he was also, I mean, I want to draw your attention to that part of his speech where he mentioned about the positive, uh, you know, um, experiences from Bangladesh where maybe India or neighboring countries has something to take up, particularly Bangladesh's successes in rural health care. And I would like to uh, add you know, Bangladesh has done very well or is doing very well in female cancer screening programs. And um, maybe, you know, Bangladesh can cooperate on those grounds. The energy is, of course, a very big area uh, where, uh, you know, we can cooperate. Uh, 
and most important of all i always put emphasis on sub regional cooperation because sub regional cooperation is something which you know can actually be beneficial to uh, all of us and uh, from professor rajiv bottacher's concluding uh, remarks i have seen that he was trying to refer to bimstick and i would also like to add bbin with that uh, of course i should have referred to uh, or i should refer to sark but sark and safta both has become increasingly insignificant and that also needs to be highlighted and you know reinvigorated or given a new life um so uh, with those words i would like to say thanks to all of you and uh, you know our relations are uh, you know our relations have been strengthened the uh, historic relations have been further strengthened historical and geographical relationship have been further strengthened through uh, uh, you know bonding of blood uh, in 1971 yeah india has been tremendously helpful in time of our need so the people of bangladesh remember that always with gratitude and the relationship cemented um through blood uh is certain uh, certain will certainly grow in their future grow further and further thank you very much thanks case case for the initiative which sir you are well within the time in time is indian standard standard time <laughs> no <laughs> thank you thanks sir. thank you thank you. okay thank you our chairperson professor dr mezba kamal sir with your great observations valuable comment on every speech the session becomes so enriched thank you sir despite of your busy schedule you are here with us thank you once again and thank you our esteemed speakers with their informative words we enriched a lot uh, and uh, here we end our first academic session uh without wasting time we are starting our second academic session in this session our uh, theme is strategic cooperation security and growth for all uh here is uh, professor aninda jyoti mojumdar as chairperson uh, thank you sir uh, uh you are welcome and despite of your busy schedule you are here with us before starting the session i want to brief about professor Anindya Jyoti Mojumdar. Anindya Jyoti Mojumdar is professor and former head at the Department of International Relations at Jadavpur University, Kolkata. His specialization areas are security and disarmament uh, uh, studies, conflict and peace studies, forced migration, foreign policy. Please, sir. Please welcome. Uh. can can you hear me clearly yes sir okay fine great uh, thanks for that uh, uh, introduction and thanks for having me in this uh, program in fact uh, without wasting my time we'll go straight into the academic session number 2 though this is uh, indian standard time but let's try to maintain a little bit of you know kind of punctuality with this regard now uh, it was nice listening to professor mesba kamal after some time but uh, okay uh, as we have already uh, come to know that uh, in this particular session there would be essentially four speakers and we have the key speaker professor siraj dadto and there would be three other uh, presentations first we will listen to them and uh, the presentations uh, will be followed by the possible a brief question answer session and towards the end uh, i may offer my wrap up comments as chairs prerogative so without wasting much time i would invite uh, professor siradha dotto if you are ready to go uh, in fact uh, you know to initiate the discussion 
and madam you have roughly uh, i would start cutting down time so 18 minutes sure i don't i don't think i would need more than that uh, <coughs> thank you uh, professor aninda jyoti mojunda thank you uh, kolkata association for asian studies and of course uh, sorry there seems to be some problem with my um okay so um i am going to speak about um, india and bangladesh and this is i think a, a kind of a pivotal moment for both of them as we've seen that uh, the kind of celebration that india and bangladesh did when it became 50 years it was 50 years of bangladesh it was 50 years of indo bangladesh relation of course and 100 years of uh, mujibur rahman uh, it was unprecedented the kind of joint celebration we've seen i say this unprecedented also because uh, we've seen we've seen a very longish phase where uh, for the longest period of time bangladesh did not even acknowledge uh, india's role uh, in the you know in the birth of bangladesh Uh, that was one phase, and uh, uh, I did hear uh, Professor uh, Mezba talk about politicization of issues, and I think this is something that anybody who studies India and Bangladesh understands that this continues to be at the core of the problem. Uh, so, for the next few minutes, I'm going to just discuss the background a little bit, and then see how this whole strategic cooperation uh, has, from bilateral level, uh, you know, developed into a more regional. Uh, Sadosphere. Uh, to begin with, as I said, this was of course unprecedented. The kind of celebrations we've had, uh, we've seen the president going, the prime minister going, our foreign minister going, foreign secretary going, all within a you know space of 14 months. And again, that's not the kind of uh, uh, very special attention that was being given. Uh, we are also right now in the midst of uh, a film being made on you know Bongo Bondhu Mujibur Rahman, also kind of. Uh, gives you impression that how important uh, political figure he is for the region for india for bangladesh of course uh, so i mean clearly while we are standing at a situation where i mean bon hom is a word that i've often used uh, but it's always that was not necessarily the you know situation we've seen uh, soon after and i know we are aware of the fact that sheikh mujibur rahman and prime minister indira gandhi enjoyed a relationship which took uh, the two bilateral relations to a certain you know a level which was unprecedented uh, but of course subsequently we've seen and there was a very stark contrast uh, the contrast was also you know it's it's it kind of tells you a story also that this is again a unique moment in history right when a third country has helped a particular country liberate itself from its particular you know uh, overwhelming counterpart Uh, the kind of blood loss that happened on both sides of course we just heard again professor kamal expressing the deep gratitude uh, but that wasn't the case always and in fact there has been time when we've also seen very very opposite narratives and uh, right now in fact i recall going back into uh, some archival work where we you know uh, on a recent work that i did on the liberation war uh, where some documents were unearthed with about the bangladesh office which was an exile in india that point of time and i don't have a piece of paper so i'm not going to quote it but it actually did uh, you know very um, quite in clear terms alluded to the fact that india's support for bangladesh uh, was basically because of a negative approach towards pakistan and i i think i'm being uh, quite definite that i'm using the word negative approach which was mentioned in the document and that for you know for political historical and economic reasons india had desires desire to weaken uh, pakistan uh, and both western east and it was not i mean and i and i noted i remember that uh, you know the, the document also talked about the fact that it was not india's love for democracy or any sense of brotherhood that uh, bangla india was wanting to uphold the you know the struggle 
so and again they kind of you know close that note by saying that uh, bangladeshis now have to resign themselves to a period of indian influence uh, but we must try and minimize that as much as possible uh, the reason i'm saying this is kind of to get the context correct as i said the kind of relation that india and bangladesh enjoys right now is unprecedented it's in fact gone far beyond what i would think mujibur rahman and indira gandhi had uh, envisioned for the region of both the you know neighbors uh, but this particular note that i'm referring to is also the different complex layers that continue to exist between the two uh, neighbors i don't think we should ever miss out on that and you know we tend to often gloss over that the beauty of the relationship the kind of partnership that we now enjoy uh, but the problem is that there are different constituencies in bangladesh and often and i've i've written about this many times that often our close proximity with awami league has also made it difficult for awami league to function because you know it's kind of constantly there's a bias involved here because there is a constituency in uh, bangladesh who's also anti india and, and also there's a constituency which is anti awami league so both ways you're kind of getting the you know negative effect so either if you're anti india then you're negative implications rub off on uh, awami league and vice versa and this is something that you know uh, again it's we've had a roller coaster ride ever since uh, sheik hasina came you know through that elections in 2009 december and i, I remember the joy and the excitement that was uh, palpable in india too i mean of course bangladesh was rejoicing because they went through two years of very very difficult period uh, and the fact that you know even without any bilateral dialogue or conversation the first thing that sheikh hasina did was actually address some of long underlying outstanding uh, security issues that india and bangladesh had in you know the challenges that which were the emanating from bangladesh soil uh, her addressing those issues actually made india open up a you know pandora of uh, uh, you know bilateral exchanges and i think that was the beginning and uh, i mean no matter what we discuss we've just heard a uh, uh, professor speak about the bilateral relations and how the deficit has been a concern but you know these are of course all work in progress and i think right now everybody is overcoming that uh, we are we I'm, i'm not sure if the number is correct but i think recently i heard we've touched uh, uh, almost 20 billion which is again you know 15 years ago we were barely a billion so from there to now the journey has been obviously outstanding uh, and i think in today's term the economists have always also talking about the fact that uh, if you have deficit here you obviously making it somewhere else so that's not something that bangladesh is you know extremely worried about at this point of time because they're doing great business with other countries so why those kind of issues and there were several other issues but i think the large context of the two bilateral relationship is security and strategy and when that is in place then you know the rest of the other minute details fall in place whether it's cross border relationship it's all our, you know all other uh, in fact we've seen again 2015 uh, the two neighbors uh, able to you know have a border closure Uh, which is something that we, they struggled for so long and uh, it's it's not very often in history that uh, two neighbors who had uh, border differences and there were differences i mean and we are aware of that uh, that they did that without any hostility on the ground uh, they were able to come together and again this would i would say it was again shekhar singh's work that helped india you know take this forward in the kind of give and take that was possible uh, but over the years we've also seen that while um, you know there's there's been so much of how would i say um, bilateral um, growth and development and i'm just not talking about the fact that india uh, supports the largest uh, you know lines of credit for bangladesh this is unprecedented again in the region and elsewhere uh, india has not done that for anyone else before but also the fact that there's several other than the first time again in the history of south asian politics uh, india has collaborated with japan to build the mass transit project which again we know uh, with, it's just a beginning it's a small beginning with the metro railways but the kind of work that is being developed with bangladesh now actually again points to the fact that we have a safe secure strategic positive framework in place uh, but again whenever we discuss bangladesh and i think all of us student of politics do understand i think the main core issue is that how do we make this relationship sustainable uh, one thing that 
needs to be always remembered is that irrespective of who's sitting in New Delhi, it doesn't matter which political party. And I, I remember when uh, the NDA came in in 2014, I was actually in Dhaka at that point of time, the kind of apprehensions that were voiced by very senior intercollutors of Bangladesh and uh, many other, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the stakeholders there. But we've seen how, despite uh, ideological, uh, I would say, uh, like being on two part of the spectrum, India and Bangladesh were able to overcome that, the kind of uh, personal uh, closeness that uh, Prime Minister Modi and Sheikh Hasina developed was, again, uh, not imagined at that point of time. But they've been able to overcome that and work together so closely. Uh, while, of course, the breakthrough, again, as I mentioned, did happen in 2010. Uh, but the point is that, while it doesn't matter who is in Delhi, India will always work closely with Bangladesh for a variety of reasons. And of course, now we uh, Bangladesh is again a very strong partner for us on the neighborhood first as well as at least. None of these plans will actually materialize if Bangladesh is not working closely with India. I mean, there's no uh, two ways about saying that. I think it's obviously accepted fact that Bangladesh needs to be part of you know these plans for us to implement and actualize them. But the same does not apply for Bangladesh. And I say this more so because I know it's almost a year now. It's going to be less than a year, actually, when Bangladesh is going to hold its next parliamentary elections. And all of us are kind of looking at that and worried. The, the, the worry is on two accounts. A, because I'm quite convinced, given the fact, given the kind of uh, development, growth trajectory that Bangladesh has seen, it is, again, you know, taken to another level. We've seen, I think there's a mention of the fact that despite COVID, despite many other uh, international developments, of course, the Ukraine crisis has led to energy issues in Bangladesh. And I guess uh, one is trying to work on that. But Bangladesh has managed a very good steady growth rate. And that's something, again, which is known also as the Bangladesh miracle. Uh, but despite that, we've seen that, you know, the two elections, the last two elections, and I mean, at this academic level, we don't know it to mince words. I certainly don't mince my word. So, uh, you know, the, the cause for concern is that an election of the past, which was which happened in 2018, now it can be argued both ways that, you know, the opposition didn't join for a variety of reasons. We've seen Bangladesh, despite having completed 50 years, despite uh, being recognized, acknowledged globally for its growth trajectory, is yet to kind of, uh, you know, appeal to a kind of a strong sense of uh, responsibility vis-a-vis with, with its own opposition. Uh, at this point of time, I would say, while, of course, you know, uh, we can see that election rallies are in place, uh, a whole lot of activity has already been unraveled, uh, but Similarly, it doesn't matter, and I know that uh, there's lots of work which has been done, positive work in Abhami League, but an election, any kind of election which is not perceived as free and fair is bound to have an effect on the bilateral relation. Uh, irrespective of whether India is interfering, not interfering, you know, there's again, a, you know, international politics is all about perception. And it's not only Bangladesh, every neighbor of India feels, and I mean, I'd love to believe that India has the capacity and wherewithal, uh, but, you know, that India can be involved, is involved, is engaged. Irrespective of that, I think the outcome of that is also going to play out. Uh, do, do I say that the entire partnership that you've developed from 2010 to 2023 is going to get unraveled? We don't know, because we've seen in the past uh, the relationship that India and Bangladesh had in 71 to 75 completely unraveled, right? Uh, you know, the political situation was that. We've also seen how a bilateral, uh, the opposition partners have visited India, have often met many of us and have expressed uh, the relationship that India and Bangladesh suffered during 2001 and 2006 should never happen again. Uh, but the point of politicization of Bangladesh, how, I mean, political parties exist everywhere, but the divisiveness that exists in Bangladesh polity is unprecedented anywhere else. Uh, the two political sides don't even sit on the same table for a conversation. And this is not recent. I'm not talking about the recent past. I, I'm, I'm tracking Bangladesh for a while. Most of you are aware of the fact. Uh, when the politics is domestic politics is so deeply divided, to expect that 
whichever party, whichever alliance comes in place to have a business as usual is going to be difficult. And this time again, as I said, that you know, Bangladesh has seen uh, a huge amount of growth in the last uh, decade or so, and there's much to. Uh, we also need to remember there are a lot of negative perceptions happening about Bangladesh. We've seen, uh, you know, corruption has been an issue right from 1972. Uh, I think all of us are aware of this issue. And we've seen again in recent years how that's kind of, again, really hit the ceiling. And that's not something that is unnoticed by the people of Bangladesh themselves. And it's a fact that, you know, while uh, Sheikh Hasina Mujib Konna is somebody that the whole country looks up to, and she really is you know, somebody who spearheaded Bangladesh into a space which is not possible for any other leader because of the acceptability that Sheikh Hasina has or enjoys is unprecedented. So coming to the position now that we see that between India and Bangladesh, the kind of cross-border facilities that we went, you know, we've built, the fact that we are able to now work and which was something that even during the best of times we were not able to in the in the pre 2010 period, how Nepal, Bhutan has been able to have, you know, easy access because of the transit, which was at some point of time, a very difficult turn term for Bangladesh, who didn't even want to use the word transit because they thought it, would, it meant it was kind of giving away that particular space or land to India, has come so easy from them. And we've been able to do that. While we speak, we have also am aware of the fact that it was in 20. Um, 15, uh, we signed the motor vehicle agreement, which essentially meant the BBI and that's been referred to that Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal would be able to do business together in a seamless way because of the cross border facilities that India and Bangladesh enjoyed. Uh, but just as we speak, even today, we've seen that there has been difference of opinion. Again, India and Bangladesh is not to be blamed on that account. There are a variety of factors that uh, which ha has held back Bang uh, both Bhutan and Nepal, you know, for that. But at the same time, if you look at the kind of regionalism, as I said, uh, more, many of the initiatives that India has uh, unfold right now, which of course looking at the regional framework would not have been possible without Bangladesh's support. I mean, I think the robustness of the relationship is something that everybody uh, is noticing. I mean, there is absolutely no two, two ways about that. But again, the fear is, and I think, and I, this is not to say that I'm uh, not um, aware of the fact that there are some uh, irritants even today as we speak. Uh, we are of course aware of the fact, I think all of us who work on the region know that uh, I think Bangladesh uh, leadership has been extremely kind about the fact that they don't bring up Tista because, you know, India has had some issues, uh, difficulty because of the federalism that we function under. But this is not lost on the common people. And many of us who are constantly in Bangladesh on where, you know, reasons, uh, even the most common man who's serving me tea outside the Dhaka University will ask me, Appa Pani Dan Nakan. Because, you know, this is something uppermost, it's emotive. And I keep arguing that just because I haven't signed a Tista doesn't mean that Tista waters are not flowing into Bangladesh. Uh, the agreement only ensures that during the lean season, which is essentially May and June, uh, that, you know, you get a certain amount of qualified water, which is actually the problem. But, I mean, while that is, we are also aware of the fact, and I uh, say this that, you know, without uh, any holes barred, that there's a lot of different messaging and wrong signaling that goes from India. We've seen how, as I said, Prime Minister Modi has certainly, uh, you know, ensured that the two bilateral relationship uh, gets stronger with time. And every little, uh, you know, uh, kind of pillar has been put in place to ensure the bilateral relations don't uh, uh, un, you know, derail. But at the same time, we've also seen some domestic noises in India for a variety of reasons, whether it's about the migratory movement, whether it's the cross-border issues, even uh, hostility on the border, which is again not lost on Bangladesh. Uh, and as you know, all of us who live in the region, we know that uh, uh, Bangladesh is extremely sensitive, extremely politically aware, and uh, they are certainly following the you know day to day developments. Uh, uh, Anindu, do I need to close in? I'm not even looking at the time. Yeah, you have uh, two minutes. Okay, so I will just wrap up saying that you know while uh, India and Bangladesh has never seen a relationship what we see today, it is unprecedented. It is completely no. I mean, a, a, a kind of a you know. It holds strength. It holds mm -hmm. all the good things and positive, uh, you know, images that 
any neighbor can enjoy but the difficulties remain and i don't think uh, india and bangladesh has addressed those difficulties and i would actually say maybe at, at a certain level it is this academia and the research area that we are able to kind of face them on board but i think at this point of time the main issue for most of us that why we believe that the kind of strategic partnership india and bangladesh enjoy should also spread to the sub region and to the regional because again we we heard just now about sark being no gainer but i'm ter- absolutely fully convinced that if bangladesh and india come together as they have continue to sustain their relationship the sub regional initiative will fall in place as well as the other regional approaches but we have to be mindful of the you know pin pricks which exist both in india and bangladesh and i think to you know be in denial about that reality is not going to serve anybody's case but i will just close in by saying that uh, we need to look at this relationship through a very positive prism which is how we do but at the same time uh, be cognizant of the you know little holes that we have and if we don't address them now they're only going to get bigger with time and then we'll be right now we have a government which works properly with us uh, post elections we don't know what happens we need to address them right here and right now to ensure that bilateralism regionalism continues to uh, foster in the re- in the region thank you very much uh, <clears throat> thank you sri radha for uh, in fact uh, flagging and explaining the crucial issues uh, influencing the dynamics of india bangladesh relations in fact uh, it's a kind of comprehensive overview that you have provided uh, of the nature of cooperation between india and bangladesh or nature of relations between india and bangladesh uh, influenced by domestic determinants in fact professor dotto has drawn our attention to uh, you know the present state of bonhomie but also to the fluctuations in relations and uh, in fact uh, you know it, it and, and the nuances of a sustainable relationship now the idea is that uh, what i i feel that it transpires from her presentation uh, that uh, perception is very crucial in 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 in, in context of this Uh, countries by bilo- in context of bilateral relations uh, which could be misperception as well but uh, nevertheless uh, as it appears uh, that it's a kind of uh, very uh, practical matter of fact kind of analysis uh, and and uh, it it also compels us to in fact uh, think over certain aspects of our relations uh, to make it in fact meaningful and as she herself has said sustainable thank you professor dotto uh i would now uh, invite the next speaker sri devabrata shen is there any uh, provision of introducing the speakers yes sir okay please uh, with your please please go ahead uh, kind permission uh, i can introduce yes uh now uh, we are welcoming Uh, our speaker devabrata shen research scholar department of political science robindra bharati university kolkata uh, his topic is indo bangladesh strategic cooperation a uh, maritime uh, a maritime perspective in the bay of bengal please welcome devabrata shen you would have roughly 12 minutes will thank that you. do thank you sir okay please go ahead good evening before i start my presentation i would like first of all to thank the organizer of this webinar calcutta society for asian studies for inviting me as well as accepting me accepting my paper and giving me the opportunity i especially thank the chair i may not be a direct student of your class sir at jadavpur university but there is no doubt that a student of political science or ir of any age or any institution will always be a indebted to you sir i also thankful sir mr ma'am and i also thank my previous speaker who needs no introduction she was in kolkata earlier we have exposed to her writings on south asia and bangladesh since our masters and to be a, on a panel with her today is an added privilege for a scholar like me after the introduction i'd like to give 
even uh, overview next i will focus on basically four points in the case of bilateral relations negotiations it is a natural and trendy reality to focus more the more on the perspective on the one particular state my previous uh, speaker so uh, sridhar ma'am already uh, talked about the perception and uh, chairman sir already mentioned the dilemma or the difficulties between the perception and misperception in ir uh, and uh, but it is not possible to completely avoid or ignore the perception of the one of the other state but if the tendency is to ignore the other country due to giving more importance to the ideology or perception of a particular state in the discussion of bilateral relations then the mutual relations between the two states can never be normal and warm for a long time therefore the discussion in this article or or my presentation also try to get glimpses of bangladesh perspective and policy even though this proposed article or presentation would primarily focus on indo bangladesh bilateral relations in the context of india strategic perspective in trying to find possible answer to my questions uh, which i mentioned my abstract and article in this uh, i in the main points that will be highlighted are the geopolitical position of bangladesh as a neighboring country from the perspective of india's strategic security on the other hand from the point of view bay of bengal the mutual relationship between india and bangladesh as a coastal state of or littoral state of the bay of bengal will also be tried to discuss which is also considered important in the maritime security of india another important factor and that has made the importance of bangladesh immense from the perspective of india sub strategic security is the recent formulation of india's act actist policy while discussing indo bangladesh bilateral relations from the perspective of bay of bengal or the wider indo pacific in contemporary times one thing that cannot be avoided in any way is china influence or china's chinese influence in the region so china's influence and its role will also be discussed above all an attempt will be made to discuss the indian navy or india's navy's role in the region from a holistic perspective that will touch upon all the above areas to ensure india's strategic interest my first point which i up to mention india bangladesh the two immediate neighbors and their geography i have to mention i would like to mention the specific one point here the 2014 verdict of international permanent court of arbitration pca uh Uh, through this verdict bangladesh has obtained its legal rights over the seabed natural resources and fish in an area up to 200 nautical miles of the bay of bengal but bangladesh does not have the proper infrastructure or extra or the extract these natural resources technologically bangladesh is considered as a underdeveloped country uh, so bangladesh needs technological assistance from foreign countries or the foreign companies because of technological inadequacy bangladesh has signed a production sharing contract with kono philips philips uh, and international oil companies uh, and others to explore oil and natural gas deep sea areas another point i have to mention uh, the increasing stake in bangladesh maritime boundaries has brought several new perspectives to the fore due to sa uh, due to the easy access of proximity of the bay of bengal to the state of malacca the presence of various foreign navies is regularly observed in the region most of the trade ships of china japan australia and the southeast asia pass through the uh, this state of malacca this sea route is considered to be the busiest sea route in the world the state of malacca is one of the world's most important uh, shipping lanes 
carrying about a quarter of world trade, including Chinese manufactured goods, and about a quarter of oil transport by sea route from the Persian Gulf up to various economies. My next submission, Bangladesh's position in India's exit policy. I have to mention, I just mentioned, I want to mention just one point here. India's foreign uh, minister, the present foreign minister, in May 2022, at the inauguration program of the Third Allies in Development and Interdependence, Asian Confluence River Conclave 2022 in Guwahati, uh, he mentioned that the coming together of the activist and neighborhood first policies will have an enormous reinforcing impact for the country beyond the confines of the Southeast Asia. From India's point of view, Jay Shankar also added that the land connectivity through Myanmar and sea connectivity through Bangladesh will open up to Vietnam and the Philippines. I want to add one more point. In this context, it is necessary to mention a statement of the External Affairs Minister, Jay Shankar, uh, said India's activist policy begins with Bangladesh, and he calls the settlement of border issues between the two neighbors a huge step forward. External Affairs Minister of India, Jashankar, feels that India-Bangladesh is better connected than ever, and the northeastern state will benefit it for it. My next point, now third point, China in Bangladesh and the Bay of Bengal region. There is no doubt that China is slightly ahead of India in terms of military power or economic power. But there is, is no room for, for uh, debate that not all problems can be solved in a linear or military or economic way. Bangladesh is one of the countries in that China has the most influence and economic footprints in the Bay of Bengal region. But one thing that is discussed in the initial parts of this discussion is that India is an immediate neighbor of Bangladesh, which always gives India an added advantage in strategic questions. As an independent sovereign state, it should be Bangladesh's own decision to choose and accept the help of which country or which international organization for development of Bangladesh. A little analysis of the real picture of China's investment in Bangladesh will show that there are mainly to perception of the growth of China's influence. One group thinks that the prime infrastructural development of Bangladesh has been achieved with China's financial assistance as well as technological support, and China's investment and financial assistance should continue in this way in the future. On the other hand, given the economic situation of some countries in this subcontinent, like Sri Lanka and Pakistan in the past few years, another group of analysis, analysts thinks that China's investment or economic aid is actually a debit trap. According to them, China wants to fulfill its, its expansionist plans behind such investments and willing to control her own overall politics, economic and strategic interest in the vast region. Another important issue I have to uh, I want to mention, according to many reports and disclosure details, China is gradually bringing Bangladesh in its debit trap, as it is already in the major supplier of arms. According to many confirmed reports, that Dhaka acquired a sizable amount of military hardware from China, which includes two submarines, missiles, guns, frigates, uh, fighter jets, and un but unfortunately now Bangladesh is facing problem as many of the arms acquired of China are given trouble. My third and the concluding point I want to mention, I would like to mention India and Indian Navy. To curb China's influence and expansionist policy in Bangladesh, experts believe that India should not only focus on the economic policy aspect, but also the military strategy aspect. Although relatively late, India has now emphasized military and strategic vision and option which has been made clear 
in some of its recent initiatives many experts believe that india is relying on the indian navy above all else to improve its strategic cooperation with bangladesh by use of its advantageous geographical location because they say that in terms of historical experience the indian navy can only protect india's military and strategic interest in the bay of bengal a number of recent military cooperation and naval patrolling exercises are agreements between bangladesh and navy and indian navy established india's initiative according to indian navy reports the fourth edition of india indo bangladesh navy coordinated patrol corpet combated uh, commenced in the northern bay of bengal in 22nd may 2022 indian navy and the bangladesh navy units will undertake joint patrolling along uh, the international maritime boundary line imbl till 23rd may 2022 as per media reports uh, devabrato you need to conclude now okay sir uh, as per media reports in october 2029 bangladesh signed a mo that will enable india to set up a coastal surveillance system radar in a uh, closer maritime security partnership between the two countries in my concluding remarks i want to share my thought india and bangladesh have been going through a holistic uh, historic bilateral political and economic relationship for more than 50 years now many experts believe that the place of social and people to people contact between the two countries is more than political and economic and so to discuss the relationship between the two countries for a particular point of view would be the unjustified with history thank you sir uh, thank you very much uh, in fact uh, devobrato has referred to activist in the pacific the malaka dilemma and as far as i understand his main uh, point of argument is that in such indian initiatives or indian policies uh, bangladesh is very crucial and uh, with regard to china's penetration in south asia obviously we have seen and india cannot really exercise any control over uh, the relations that individual states might like to have with china but on the whole uh, you know we might say that uh, you know bangladesh has maintained a kind of balanced approach in this regard and uh, as far as i understand you are thinking in terms of india having some kind of military tie up with bangladesh well uh, in fact it is uh, the generally said the golden chapter of the relations between the two countries so if both the countries the feel that Uh, this kind of military tie up would be mutual uh, you know kind of would result in mutual benefit i think there would be negotiations on those aspects as well so thank you very much for your presentation uh, the next speaker dr ranjan shah dr ranjan shah west bengal education service assistant professor department of history moulana azad college kolkata His topic is Indian involvement in Bangladesh Liberation War seventy one humanitarian uh, intervention or cold calculation. Please welcome Dr. Anjun Shah. Dr. Shah, twelve minutes. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Honorable uh, Chairperson, sir, uh, and other distinguished uh, dignitaries. Uh, due to shortage of time i would go straight into the presentation uh, it must be noted that in the winter of 1971 when the cold war affected relations among states and military intervention was largely a tool for great powers india's decision to send troops in the then east pakistan was seen as aggressive by many However, history is littered with instances when bordering host countries may intervene militarily in refugee-producing neighboring countries in an attempt to stem and reverse refugee flows. Uh, Vietnam, for example, intervened militarily in Cambodia in 1978 after supporting refugees uh, fleeing Pol Pot's regime since 1975. the vietnamese had other reasons as well such as a show of power to thailand and ending genocide in cambodia 
However, the refugee aspect and the need to repatriate them cannot be overlooked. More recently, in 2008, Ethiopia sent troops into Somalia, fearing attacks from Islamic forces there. And the fact that Ethiopia hosts over 2,58,000 Somali refugees is a pertinent factor. Because the intervention failed and Ethiopia was forced to withdraw its forces, it could not reap the benefits it had anticipated. Indeed, the situation worsened as the conflict produced more refugees on its soil. However, a successful intervention could end conflict in Somalia hypothetically, which in turn could allow refugees to return home. And as regarding the genesis of the crisis, uh, it's a bit known fact, so I would go straight into uh, reasons explaining India's intervention. Uh, the Bengalis of East Pakistan were then fighting for self-determination and hence the kind of rebellion the refugees, the Indian refugees uh, were engaged in in the 50s, 60s uh, had little to do with India's treatment of refugees or the living condition in refugee camps. Although it has to be admitted that living situation was very poor. Given that a government in exile was formed in Agartala, India, which was also the base of operations, it is perhaps almost inevitable that the nearby areas would become militarized. Although the refugee camps themselves were not militarized, they served as fertile recruitment ground. The Far Eastern Economic Review ran a story on militarization on September 2, 1971, which reads, Eyewitnesses report the Mukti Fauj is getting increasingly better organized and claims more and more younger men are joining it. An intensive recruitment drive is on in the camps to enlist all men and boys from the age of 14 up. The question that becomes relevant is whether militarization played any role in India's decision to intervene. On the one hand, militarization is is a negative externality, but on the other, if the warriors are better trained, it increases the likelihood of success in the war, which would entail the end of conflict, allowing refugees to go back home. Was this the reason why the government was sympathetic towards Mukti Fauj? It may be argued that the arms the Indian government uh, provided the Mukti Fauj for fighters were often of low quality, even obsolete, which shows that India's support was more symbolic than strategic. Was the Indian government actually worried about the militarization aspect? In this particular case, it's difficult to make the point either way because the topic of militarization had not come up during any of the parliamentary debates in India during the period. There is mention of militarization in these few reports, like I mentioned uh, uh, above, but nothing to reveal the negative perception of the government of India with regards to militarization. Thus, all the militarization in general sense can create aggressive tendencies. In this particular case, it does not seem that way. Uh, Indra Gandhi, as is known, uh, had owned the national election say, in March 1971, largely based on our Garibi Hatao or End Poverty Election Campaign, and with refugees, Bangladeshi refugees creating a havoc, a strain on her already limited resources. It was quite clear that she won't be able to add her to her mandate. All the locals in West Bengal were largely sympathetic towards the refugees, owing to ethnic ties and would overlook Indira's predicament, locals in areas such as Assam and Tripura were rather disgruntled. The introduction of new ration cards for refugees had generated inflationary pressure, raising prices of basic food items, creating grievances among locals. Partly for re-election purposes, Indira had perhaps to ensure that the refugees do not impose a long-term problem. But it is unclear whether or not this was a major issue because the refugee influx was an external shock and not created by her or the Congress party. Would the voting public not recognize the difference between deliberate and inadvertent breaking of promises? Strategically, if Pakistan could convince the world and its population in West Pakistan that the crisis is a product of Indo-Pakistan rivalry and not of Pakistan's military repression, brutal genocide of its population in the East. Pakistan then could escape international and domestic rebuke, especially given Pakistan's sense of national unity that was based on anti-India sentiments to claim that rebels in East Pakistan were Indian pawns provided military and political lineage, as well as international and domestic support.
In Indira Gandhi's 24th May speech delivered in Lok Sabha, he said emphatically, we will quote, it is mischievous to suggest that the India has had anything to do with what happened in Bangladesh. This is an insult to the aspirations and spontaneous sacrifice to the people of Bangladesh and a calculated sinister attempt by the rulers of Pakistan to make India a scapegoat for their own mistakes. It is also a crude attempt to deceive the world community. Uh, Hamur Sen, India's permanent representative to the UN, also spoke in a similar manner. But of course, it was in India's interest to downplay the rivalry factor and focus more on humanitarian issues involved. Even if the division of Pakistan was on the agenda, it was something that was never expressed publicly. Uh, uh, the fact that India had chosen not to discuss the Pakistan factor may indicate strategic behavior, choosing to focus on the humanitarian plight because that would be more popular and acceptable. Uh, perhaps the question is about long-term versus short-term outcome. While in the immediate term, it was important to focus on pressing matters of the time, refugees, India may have realized that long-term effect of resolving the short-term problem through military intervention would be promising in terms of gaining regional dominance. During discussion in Parliament about the effect of refugees on India's economy, a recurring theme was the frustration that India was the sole bearer of the world. The Prime Minister not only argued that it was an international crisis, but also sent emissaries abroad to gain support for Bangladesh. Uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi felt that the international community could pressure the Pakistani government to stop genocide. There had been some international pressure on Pakistan to resolve the issues, although the focus was more on refugees instead of the legitimacy of the elected government. The UN, especially the Secretary General Uth Hunt, condemned Pakistan's action in East Pakistan and asked the international community to assist India in its efforts to provide refuge to those fleeing conflict. But unfortunately, Cold War politics got in the way. Uh, the U.S. didn't want to antagonize Pakistan for fear of losing China. The Soviet Union didn't want to get involved in another major controversy. And China, having fought a war with India in 1962, was not willing to get involved either. It was following the inaction of major powers that India decided to mobilize its embassies. Meanwhile, uh, as on 15 December 1971, uh, India was uh, facing, uh, it was, uh, there have been uh, 825 refugee camps uh, opened in states like West Bengal, Tripura, Meghalaya, Assam, Bihar, and even Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, numbering to 70 lakhs, and at least 30 lakhs uh, refugees were uh, there outside the camps. And the statistic that stands out uh, is the one for Tripura, where the refugee population was almost as large as the local population. And not surprisingly, locals in the region were getting restive and antagonistic towards the new arrivals. According to a report which appeared in Far Eastern Economic Review in September 1971, Tripura's rape secretary expressed serious apprehensions over the long-term consequences of hosting such a large number indicating that there is likely to be animosity among locals due to perception uh, as well as uh, real competition. And it becomes clear by May June 1971 that India's resources are stretched thin and they were almost over overwhelmed by the masses of refugees uh, coming in. Prime Minister India, in her speech delivered in the Rajya Sabha on 15 June, stated that, quote, if even 10,000 refugees arrive in any European country, the whole continent of Europe will be afire with all the newspapers, the governments, everybody will be aroused. We are trying to deal with nearly 7 million human beings who have fled from a region of terror, who have come wounded with disease, illness, hunger, and exhaustion. When diplomatic talks failed, the Prime Minister himself, herself, went on a world to, to garner support. In all her speeches, uh, whether by the Prime Minister or any senior minister, India's representatives were clear and consistent in saying that India would be unable to support refugees for longer than six months, even though they were not very really specific about what would happen after that six-month period was over. And now I'm coming to the... If yes. You need to uh, yes, sir, I would.
And now I'm coming to the conclusion, concluding portion. In the short run, in intervention for India meant refugee repatriation. And in the long run, it meant a divided Pakistan and regional dominance. While the long-term incentives can be deemed constant for a country such as India seeking preponderance, they have little explanatory power in terms of explaining the timing of intervention. And it is this gap an explanation based on refugee fulfills. Having ensured that the international community would remain uh, deaf to the calls of help, India was able to utilize a cost-benefit analysis based on purely her uh, national interests. And uh, in the last 50 years, India has risen dramatically both in economic and military terms, especially relative to its neighbors, most notably Pakistan. Did Pakistan's demise or division aid that process? If the answer is definitive yes, then India's action in 71 could be justified along such lines, at least in retrospect. However, Pakistan had maintained that East Pakistan didn't add much to its economy as a result of which its segregation didn't have much impact. But in contrast, one can argue that loss of Pakistan meant the loss of cultural and ethnic diversity, the loss of a moderate voice in an Islamic state, and the loss of democratic principles, which eventually stunted Pakistan's rise, despite reaching nuclear parity with India. Moreover, in 1971, India signaled to the world that it will not sit idle when its national interests are at stake. Even though India's action at the time was based on the state of economy affected by the refugees, the longer run effect has been to establish India as a credible regional power. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shah. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Shah actually tells us uh, whether India's involvement in the Bangladesh Liberation War was uh, mere humanitarian intervention or, in effect, a strategic uh, calculated move. Now, this is one way of looking at it. Strategic motivations were many. And, uh, in fact, uh, no intervention, humanitarian or otherwise, uh, is free from strategic calculations. Uh, the intervening party will seek to settle the issue as per its preferences. Uh, there was obviously an objective to obliterate Pakistan's Eastern Front. But at the same time, of course, uh, you know, the, the you know, strategic motivations that you have uh, very, very rightly, you know, kind of uh, enumerated, it, it is also to be taken into consideration that, uh, yes, international problem, international politics is all about power, national interest, uh, realism, and things like that. But uh, how can one completely ignore the humanitarian aspects as well, as it was happening just, in fact, at our border? And uh, we were not free from the kind of uh, impact it had on the psyche of Indian people, especially the Bengalis in this part of the, uh, you know, kind of uh, this region. So basically, uh, thank you for uh, pointing out the strategic calculations. Uh, but there is some kind of complexity that comes in when we think in terms of the emotional aspects and uh, in, in fact, to try to accommodate uh, emotion, you know, into a, some kind of rational decision making. It plays its own role. So it, it, it is obviously just, just a kind of comment uh, for you to consider uh, in your future endeavors. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next presentation, final presentation of the session will be from Dr. Papri Chakraborty. Dr. Papri Chakraborty. Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, University of Gaurgambo, Malda, India. Her topic is Negotiating Repatriation of the Rohingya refugees, the need for India-Bangladesh Security Initiative. Please welcome Dr. Papri Chakraborty. Madam, you are muted. Thank you. Thank you, a respected chairperson, respected key speaker, dignitaries of cases, eminent professor from Bangladesh, learned co-speakers, and learned audience. 
Good evening to all. Today, the topic of my presentation, as is introduced, negotiating repatriation of the Rohingya refugees, the need for India-Bangladesh security initiative. Now, I begin by quoting Prime Minister Hasina, as she emphasized India-Bangladesh relation during his visit to India in 2019 as a bond transcending strategic relationship. Uh, now coming to Rohingyas, according to United Nations, Rohingya are, Rohingyas are the most persecuted minority in the world. Former United Nations High Commission of, uh, for Human Rights, Zayed Rad Al Hussein, marked the 2017 Rohingya refugee crisis as a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Rohingyas are basically stateless Muslim minorities in Theravada Buddhism dominated Myanmar. They have been denied citizenship since 1982 by Myanmar. In 2017, more than 7 lakh 42,000 stateless Rohingya refugees fled persecution in Myanmar and took shelter in Bangladesh refugee camp, joining another 2 lakh uh, refugees who fled Myanmar previously. World's largest refugee camp is situated in Cox's Bazar district of Bangladesh, comprising these Rohingya refugees. According to UNHCR data, as on 30th November 2022, the refugee population in Bangladeshi camps is 9,50,972. According to UNHCR statistics, 49% of the refugees are children and 25% are women. To cut the story short, on 25th August 2017, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, the self-proclaimed mouthpiece of Rohingya rights in Rakhine province of Myanmar, stormed police and military establishment in Myanmar. In retaliation, Tatmadaw, the Myanmarese military, carried on the massive ethnic cleansing operation in Rohingya village of Rohingya province, Rakhine, uh, sorry, Rakhine province of Myanmar, which triggered the 2017 exodus of Rohingya people from Myanmar. India promptly responded by conducting Operation Insaniyat. On the other hand, India decided to deport the Rohingya people stand, stranded inside India. This was criticized by opposition in Indian parliament as exporting Insaniyat without showing Insaniyat within country. It is to be noted that for Rohingya refugees in Bangladeshi camp, India used the nomenclature displaced persons, whereas inside India, they are considered as illegal immigrants and big security threat. This would tantamount to straight jacketing persecuted Rohingya people with the Islamic extremists like ARSA. Non-recognition of the dire threat of persecuted vulnerable Rohingya people may lead to radicalization of them since ARSA's presence is evident in India. In the present paper, security refers to both state security and people's security of the entire South and Southeast Asian region because Rohingya refugee crisis is not only Asian humanitarian crisis, but it has raised global concern when in November 2019, Gambia, backed by Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, filed a case in Inter International Court of Justice against Myanmar for committing genocidal crime against Rohingya people. So far as the term repatriation is concerned, it refers to not forceful repatriation uh, in the present paper, not any kind of token repatriation agreement as was signed by 2000, in 2017 between Bangladesh and Myanmar, mediated by China, but sustainable, peaceful, voluntary repatriation of the Rohingya refugees. For the voluntary uh, repatriation, confidence among the refugees needs to be built by addressing their perception of threat. For sustainable repatriation and as a precondition of confidence building measures among the refugees, only developmental aid to Myanmar for rebuilding Rakhine province, the homeland of the Rohingyas, in the form of constructive engagement will not be sufficient. After the February 2021 coup by Tatmadaw in Myanmar, situation changed drastically. Civil disobedience movement, activities of ethnic armed groups in Myanmar and military operation destabilized Myanmar, affecting the neighboring countries. The OIC and Western countries and Myanmar's exiled national unity government led by the Aung San Suu Kyi vowed to assist ICJ by providing the required information about the genocide perpetrated against Rohingyas. This made the situation favorable for both India and, and Bangladesh the two parties of 1948 Genocide Convention to put pressure on Myanmar Junta government. However, it is a challenge for India to put pressure on Myanmar Junta by crossing the threshold of persuasion regarding repatriation, as India has its stake in 
Trilateral Highway Project, Kaladan Multimodal Transit and Transport Project with Myanmar. Myanmar is a gateway pivotal neighboring state for India to realize India's activist policy. Insurgency in Northeast India is yet another security concern for India. Security threat to economic projects are also of a grave concern for India, even if India keeps open communication channels uh, with the authoritarian government of Myanmar. A positive aspect is that under huge inter international pressure, Myanmar junta government has agreed to repatriate uh, the Rohingyas. But given the turbulent situation in Myanmar, Rohingyas are losing confidence on Myanmar. On the other hand, National Unity Government in Exile, led by National League of Democracy, reportedly has promised to arm, uh, sorry, uh, promised to amend Myanmar's constitution for giving citizenship to Rohingyas in a very cautious manner. Here I want to share an intention survey report conducted by UNHCR. In that survey report, intentions of total uh, 2,846 Rohingya refugees hosted by Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, Nepal, Thailand, Malaysia were surveyed. Rohingya in that report, Rohingyas who uh, are waiting for return from the six host uh, countries raised five key issues to be dealt with by Myanmar before voluntary repatriation and those are safety and security, citizenship and documentation, land and livelihoods, freedom of movement and education. But 2021 authoritarian junta regime makes entire domestic situation more turbulent as evident in the view expressed by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi during his visit to Bangladesh in 2022. Although under pressure, Myanmar's junta has started the uh, documentation process, the nascent stage of repatriation, we can call it, Bangladesh should be cautious about the fact that the repatriation negotiation with Tatmadaw may yield only token repatriation, which may be tantamount to jumping from the frying pan to the fire for the Rohingya refugees. February 2021, ARSA, that is Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, the self-proclaimed mouthpiece for the Rohingya right, uh, is losing its ground in Rakhine province. It is reportedly gradually concentrating in Bangladeshi camps. It is engaged in killing, abduction, and recruiting vulnerable Rohingya refugees in Arsa. Uh, it is allegedly killed. Uh, it allegedly killed Rohingya leaders working on refugee repatriation. Uh, like, for instance, Advocate Muhibullah, the head of the Arakan Rohingya Society for Peace and Human Rights, who was working on project Going Home for the Repatriation of Rohingya Refugees, was allegedly assassinated by ARSA in 2021, as claimed by his family. Bangladesh launched Operation Root Out to stop these targeted killings by uprooting ARSA. After emergence of Tatmado rule uh, in Myanmar in 2021, the previously defunct Rohingya Solidarity Organization, a rival organization of ARSA, reappeared in Bangladesh camps. So uh, making the situation more grave for the Rohingya refugees there. However, facing obstruction from Myanmar and uprooted from Bangladeshi camps, ARSA may expand its Western, uh, in Western front, uh, may infiltrate in India. This would lead to further radicalization. In this situation, it is highly essential to change the threat perception of the Rohingya people, which will determine whether they will take side of the states or non-state actors like Islamic extremists. Various surveys conducted in Delhi, Jomu, and other camps reveal that persecuted Rohingyas are perceived, sorry, perceiving threat from the policy of deportation. However, in April 2021, the Supreme Court of India said that Rohingya detained in Jammu should not be deported unless proper procedure is followed. India is not a party to the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 <laughs> protocol, and therefore India. Dr. Chakraborty, you have just uh, two minutes to conclude. Sir. Yes, sir. India does not have a focused refugee policy. India is not the capital of the immigrant of the world, as stated by Solicitor General Tushar Mehta, representing the center in March 2018 in the case of Muhammad Salimullah versus Union of India. The petition was filed for the recognition of protection of. Rohingya Muslims, the affidavit filed on behalf of the Union of India also stated that uh, increasing influx of Rohingyas is the root cause of spread of terrorism. This is the problem. But however, uh, uh, in uh, India has to uh, 
has to be very cautious about the nomenclature illegal immigrant. However, in March 2020, uh, in Indian Union of Muslim League versus Union of India case, India finally acknowledged that Rohingya Muslims faced persecution. So finally, Rohingyas are recognized as persecuted people by India, which is more of a humanitarian approach expected by its neighbors. Herein lies the difference between extremists and Rohingya refugees. Bangladesh has also requested for India's cooperation in the repatriation process, but given the present situation in Myanmar, it is hard to build confidence among the Rohingya refugees in favor of voluntary repatriation. China may acknowledge the fact that Myanmar has internal problems as expressed by Wang Yi, but China is not willing to address the international terrorism issue unilaterally. According to Professor Mojumdar, who is present amongst us, uh, in one of his articles published in the Asian Problematic in the 21st century, to quote him, China has taken care not to be seen spearheading war against Islamic terrorists. It is to be noted, Myanmar has official de officially declared ARSA as a terrorist group. China is in favor of multilateral engagement so far as tackling international terrorism is concerned. So taking that into consideration, India and Bangladesh can very much raise the issue in BCIM, that is Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar Forum. On the other hand, India and Bangladesh can take the other four host countries in confidence, namely Indonesia, Nepal, Thailand, Malaysia, for negotiating voluntary sustainable repatriation. India and Bangladesh may can communicate with national unity government through diplomatic channels as done by US and France. The reason being Myanmar's turbulence in Myanmar during recent junta regime has tremendous impact on India's Northeast as the civil disobedience movement along with clashes uh, between the junta and the NUJ, ERO, displaced around 50,000 individuals belonging to... <coughs> Dr. Chakraborty, please conclude. Yes, the conclusion is that deporting all, the, all of them will go against the principle of non refoulement which is a customary law. So on the one hand, recognizing Rohingyas as persecuted people and by crossing the threshold of merely pursuing military government of Myanmar, India and Bangladesh should focus on negotiating nationality issue of persecuted Rohingyas as the precondition of sustainable, peaceful, voluntary repatriation, keeping in mind the democratic values, thereby building confidence among the Rohingya refugees and asylum seekers so that they do not lose hope and do not join extremists. This is a humanitarian dimension to ensure success to the economic efforts and sustainable growth and development of Asia. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chakraborty. Essentially, here we find yet another complex situation that is, uh, in fact, uh, where uh, the role of national interest uh, is overriding uh, humanitarian considerations but cannot be entirely neglected. This uh, leads me to think over another aspect that is, there is uh, this UNHCR, the UN body. And uh, what it is doing, in fact, it, apparently in contemporary period, uh, the UN bodies are uh, least effective when they are most needed. So this is another dimension of the issue. And uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, I, I think you might include a section, perhaps a subsection in your uh, paper as well, uh, to discuss the kind of role that uh, international bodies can play in this particular uh, issue. So thank you very much. Uh, can we have any kind of brief discussion? Or Sir, there are here are some questions in our uh, chat box. Uh, the first is from our uh, respected professor, Dr. Mezba Kamal. Uh, Sir asked, Anjun Shah referred to Mukti Poj as low quality, May I ask, in what sense it was a guerrilla warfare and didn't they do well? And uh, another question is from Onnesha Shaha. Uh, Onnesha wrote, myself Onnesha from the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, the University of Calcutta. My question is, uh, Professor pra Papri, ma'am, India have no perfect refugee law, ma'am. Uh, even we are not a signatory of inter, uh, international refugee law. So, ma'am, in that case, what can be your suggestion on that? 
Okay, uh, Dr. Ranjan Shah, would you respond? Are you there? In fact, I didn't get that particular word, what Professor Kamal has uh, pointed out. Do you have him here? He is here online, but uh, not responding. Um, I just saw him get disconnected. He seemed to have, I think he's disconnected. Maybe you can, there's another question for Papi, I can see. Uh, there is a question for Papi as well. So, uh, you know, Papi, uh, Papi. Yes, in, in fact, you, you, you can respond to the question that has been Yes, asked. Uh, India is not a signatory party to the refugee convention or uh, the protocol. But uh, that is why India doesn't have a focused refugee policy. And what is needed is that uh, India may proceed to that. Uh, but other than that, for uh, keeping in mind international, sorry, national interest and some humanitarian uh, um, moorings. Uh, India, what I have argued in my paper presentation, that India should be cautious about uh, the nomenclature it is using for the uh, displaced persons, asylum seekers, as I have already told that in uh, uh, Supreme Court, uh, India has, Union of India has already acknowledged uh, Rohingyas as persecuted people, but merely per acknowledging persecuted people and that too uh, based on religious identities will not be very uh, sustainable uh, for India's uh, refugee policy, if at all it will take uh, any refugee policy per se. But yes, it has to have some focused refugee policy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, since... Uh, Dr. Shah is not there. Uh, in fact, uh, she should have, he should have been there to respond to the question. Uh, I didn't really get that particular, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this low quality aspect of Bhukti Pauja, something of that sort from his presentation. But obviously, uh, you know, uh, that is that is not the way. In in fact, uh, to perceive. Uh, in fact, uh, these uh, the valiant efforts that Mukti Fauj obviously is known for. Anyway, uh, we really this is eight o'clock, so uh, I, I just ask the organizers. Uh, I have a problem with my device, so so now the camera is not working. So perhaps you cannot see me right now. You can hear my voice, but uh, in fact, uh, do we have five minutes? The chair's prerogative, or do you close, in fact, the session right now? Yes, sir. Please continue. Okay, I, I will. I won't take much time. Uh, I, I would simply say, uh, in fact, uh, that it was a kind of uh, nice session, uh, kind of learning experience for me. But when we try to understand relations between two countries, in fact, there could be thousand points of contact and plethora of issues between two states in bilateral relations. Uh, not all of these are uh, apparently strategic. It is the approach actually towards these issues uh, that makes certain uh, issues strategic. And these are not necessarily security centric in true sense or as understood in conventional terms, but it is the approach to a, a particular issue that makes it strategic. For example, you know, uh, we, you know, relations can be analyzed from different perspectives. My favorite approach essentially, in fact, when I wrote an article long before in India Quarterly on making sense of India-Bangladesh relations, I focused on geopolitics. I focused on attitudinal influence, so the kind of attitude we harbor towards each other, and also the functional exchanges. And then there is, of course, the idea of in human ingenuity, that you have certain given things uh, like, you know, geographical arrangements that you cannot change. But how do you interpret that? How do you perceive that? How do you take initiatives? All these would depend on human ingenuity. 
So there will be the question. So that you would consider the borders, you know, there is a saying, border as bridges or borders as barriers. It depends on the people of both the countries. You know, if you think of attitude, whether you would accommodate or there would be hostility, you know, in terms of politicization, strategizing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There is cultural proximity. There is arrogance of power. There is the need for nation building. The situation is complex. If you think of functional exchanges, that is essentially economic uh, relations, trade, etc., uh, investment. Uh, but then again, one can use economic instruments like giving concessions, etc., as reward, or can create hurdles as a coercive strategy. So whether you should go for optimum advantage or weaponization. In each case, I usually find that when we talk about strategic issues, issues of high politics or issues of low politics, it is essentially at a particular given point of time how the states would like to interpret their objectives and how they would therefore formulate strategies to achieve those objectives actually uh, influence the uh, relations between the two parties. So there would be fluctuations. Uh, there would be stages of, uh, you know, the current golden chapter that we are experiencing in India-Bangladesh relations. There would be fluctuations, which is natural. But on the whole, uh, you know, I would just borrow these uh, words from Professor Sridhar Dotto that there should be a sustainable relationship, a relationship that would be mutually advantageous for both the parties, because there is no gain if you, you know, kind of weaponize uh, everything, not merely our political or relations, but also our economic and other functional cultural relations. So that is what uh, I thought uh, would you know, be by from my side by wrapping up comments. I have uh, enjoyed this particular session. Uh, there were different kinds of viewpoints that were expressed. And I thank all the presenters and also uh, the organizers and the audience who have been with us for this whole session. Thank you very much. I want to thank our chairperson, Professor Anindu Jyoti Mojumdar. Thank you, sir. And uh, you chaired so skillfully. Your valuable notes are so precious. We are enriched enough. Thank you once again. And thank you all our speakers of second academic sessions. Your valuable speech, no doubt spreading knowledge. Thank you all. And uh, here on behalf of Kolkata Society for Asian Studies, as an assistant secretary of Kolkata, Asian, uh, uh, Kolkata Society for Asian Studies, I, Dr. Deptushi Mr. Choudhury, assistant professor, Sharojini Naidu College for Women, ending second academic session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, especially Shorvishta. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Uh, we all enjoyed and all getting so enriched uh, with this session. The session is so successful. Camera is now. I'm requesting uh, Shivli Bharti to start the next session. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Shivli Mukti, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, Pishik Shadhan College. So after a very enriching session, now we are at the uh, we are at a time when we are going to start with our third academic session. And the theme of this uh, academic session is Act is Policy, Strengthening Indo-Bangladesh Future Relations. We are graced and we are grateful that Professor Imon Kolan Lahiri, head of the department 
of international relations jadavpur university has given his kind consent to chair this session in this session there are two papers the first paper will be deliberated by dr shotarupa pal assistant professor in political science ashutosh college kolkata the topic of her lecture is act east policy perspectives from india bangladesh relation we have another speaker and she is dr dona ganguli assistant professor department of political science the bhavanipur educational society so before we initiate this session i would like to uh, say a few words about the chairperson of today's session professor imon kunlal lahiri who is a professor and head of the department of international relations jadavpur university kolkata he is the general secretary of the jadavpur association of international relations jair and the executive editor of jair he is the director of the school of international relations and strategic studies jadavpur university he has been in the 2007 visiting fellow at the university of south carolina the united states of america under us summer institute program department of state united states of america his self authored books include peace development and community the lookest imagination of india with special reference to northeast india malaysia's foreign policy under deto seri dr mahathir mohammad and mahathir islam a socio political construal he has edited many other books as a second seasoned expert in international relations he has organized several conferences and presented more than 100 research articles in conferences seminars and round table discussions he is also a regular commentator in newspaper and on audio visual media on international affairs his area of specialization and expertise includes china south asia indo pacific and non traditional security threats we are honored sir that you have agreed to chair this session so without any further delay i would request dr shotarupa pal to give her lecture thank you sir may i start you have muted yeah please please do now hey shotarupa you are going to speak yes, first sir. right yeah please sir may i start sir please please okay sir uh today's my uh, pa paper entitled as actist Poli policy perspective from india bangladesh relation the prime minister uh, narendra modi announced the upgrading india's erstwhile lookist policy to a more action oriented actist strategy at the india nation summit in myanmar in november 2014 since then much debate and discussion has taken place on the nature and content of the strategy and however various pronouncements by india as well as the shifting patterns of its engagement with countries to its east are beginning to throw lights an actist is trying to take note of the rapid complex development in the region particularly changes in the economic and security dynamics most of the statements are attributable prime minister modi who has contextually alluded to actist policy on several occasions as mentioned earlier the uh, the first of this was at the asian summit in november 2014 in myanmar when he announced the upgrading of uh, of, of the lep to the action oriented actist policy and soon after 
external minister Sushma Swaraj underlined India's effort to engage more deeply with Southeast Asia uh, through the activist policy and described Thailand as a significant partner in this respect, uh, respect during her visit to Bangkok in June 2015. And notwithstanding these various utterance, some confusion continues to prevail over the precise scope and content of the policy. The main reason for the confusion could be absence of an official vision um, a statement from India outlining the uh, policy. And uh, there are uh, so many, uh, there are so many uh, uh, the correlations uh, which are very much significant for uh, in in terms of the activist policy between ba Bangladesh and India's relations. The year 2021 witnessed celebrations of 50th anniversary of the Bangladesh independence and 50 years of Bangladesh-India diplomatic relations. And Bangladesh was not only a key part of the India's uh, neighborhood fast policy policy, but also important for New Delhi's activist policy, which. Uh, try to cement ties between India and Southeast Asia. There are so many uh, significant area between the Indian and Bangladesh relations, um, like geopolitical significance, uh, economic significance, the trades, connectivity to the uh, of Northeast, and um, uh, and uh, um, uh, and uh, challenges in the Indian and Bangladesh relationship, uh, ships and BBIN agreement and uh, BBIN agreement, etc. And I, uh, I'm now I'm trying to hi highlight the what are the geopolitical uh, significance between India and Bangladesh. Uh, in 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 terms of the security concern of Northeast, a friendly Bangladesh can ensure that its soil is not used to anti-Indian activities. Bangladesh action resulted in the arrest of many top leaders of the Northeast insurgent groups. Like like United Liberation Front to, of Assam and National Democratic Front of Borderland. And bridge to Southeast Asia, uh, Bangladesh is the natural pillar of the act activist policy and it can act as a bridge to economic and political linkages with Southeast Asia and beyond. Bangladesh is an important uh, component of the BIMSTEC and BBIN initiative. Securing sea lines of communication, Bangladesh is strate strategically placed nearby import important sea, uh, sea lanes and it can play a significant role in containing piracy in the Indian Ocean and fighting uh, fighting terrorism and um, and um, and uh, stable and open and tolerant Bangladesh helps India in uh, uh, stopping extreme, extremist, extremists from the flourishing there and also in cooperation of the de-radicalization efforts, sharing intelligence and other counter-terrorism efforts. And balancing China is the another significance by which a neutral Bangladesh would um, ensure containment of an assertive China in this region, um, region and help in uh, countering its string of policy and in, in terms of the economic uh, significance steps have been taken in including uh, reductions in custom and immigrant documents establishment of the land custom station integrated check po uh, check post etc in terms of the trade relations bangladesh and india's biggest trade partner in the south asia india bangladesh have um, facilitated trade agreement both are the members of the asian uh, pacific trade agreement which is uh, termed as apta and sark preferential uh, trade agreement SAFTA and the agreement of the South Asian free trade area SAFTA which uh, govern the ta uh, tariff regimes of trade. <coughs> Connectivity of the Northeast, as we know that the Bangladesh situated in the strategic location um, to our country and it connects our Northeast, uh, various Northeast uh, states like Asham and Tripura. <coughs> The northeastern states landlocked have a um, shorter route to sea through Bangladesh. This agreement with Bangladesh will spark socioeconomic development and integration of the northeast India through protocol or inland water transit and trade. India is assisting Bangladesh to capture the potential of waterways um, for both inner and intra-border connectivity of Bangladesh. Train services in Dhaka and Kolkata Khulna are doing well in uh, doing well, and the Agartala and um, Akruna route is under construction, and five additional bus service was also introduced um, uh, since 2018. And um, Dhaka Kolkata cruise ship um, also launched. And India Bangladesh have shared the history, common heritage, culture, and 
both the country follow the uh, same language uh, that is bengali and Chale and there are so many other uh, strained relations um, um, um uh, strained relation uh, took place between the india and the bangladesh and it um, comes as a challenge like river disputes india shares 54 transboundary rivers with bangladesh some of the major dispute in, include this the water river sharing issue and the um, Pipai Muk hydroelectric power projection, the Borak River and the Gonga River uh, dispute, etc. Illegal Im immigrants and Rohingya crisis also took place uh, between India and Bangladesh issues, and the border management uh, was also is also very much necessary to tackle the. Um, uh, border uh, border issues between the two countries and delaying project execution as of 2017 India had extended lines of credit worth approximately 7.4 billion dollar however less than 10 percent of the Q, uh, cumulative commitments have been dis disbursed so far also there is delay in the implementation of the BBI in Bangladesh Bhutan India Nepal initiative projects and um, Increasing rad radicalization presence of group like Harkal Al Jihad, uh, Il Islami, and Jamaati Islami, uh, etc. Um, the um, anti uh, produced anti um, anti Indian sentiments in Bangladesh, and their propaganda could spill across the border, and uh, the. BBIN project was conceived when SARC is 18 submit in the Kathmandu and failed to sign a SARC motor vehicle agreement in November 2014, chiefly because of the Pakistan. And Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal have signed the sub regional motor vehicle agreement MBA. MPA in June 2015 for regulations of the passenger, personal, and the cargo uh, vehicle uh, tariff between the four BBIN countries. Originally, BBIN and MBA mentioned the 30 identified priority transport connectivity project with an estimated low cost over approx. $8, um, $8 billion and that will um, ablate and update re remaining sections of the trade and transport corridors in the BBIN countries. And apart from that, India and Nepal, Bangladesh have ratified the agreement while Bhutan failed to get it permanence not to ratify the same. It has some reservation about the environmental impact owing to in increased um, traffic of, of heavy duty vehicles under south asia sub regional economic cooperation program asian development bank has been providing technical advisory and financial support to this in initiative on november 2015 a cargo vehicle made the first successful trial turn from the kolkata to agartala via bangladesh that reduced the distance um, over, uh, by over a thousand kilometers, and um, and after two th 2019, uh, co after co COVID 19, the Chitango port um, would be would uh, would be uh, um, a considerable considerable fact to um, to more uh, connective uh, relations between India and Bangladesh because it uh, connects the northern state um, indian northern state like tripura and asham to the bangladesh and uh, apart from that waterways roadways can connect and uh, and um, uh, sh and uh, also sh um, um, yeah, it uh, and it is hoped that in near future the both the countries um, can share uh, their uh, culture, their uh, their culture, their ethos, and um, their uh, technological aspect, educations, and the interchange um, may strengthen um, strengthen each other, um, each other nations, and then the um, the neighborhood policy, like the fast neighborhood policy, like the act policy may may um, uh, implement its desirable goals that that's all thank you thank you so thank we'll, you sir yeah we'll come to the discussion afterwards so now may i request donor to just uh, present the deliberations maybe for 12 minutes 12 to 10 to 12 minutes. okay sure sir Next, we have Dr. Dona Ganguly, who is the Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, the Bhavanipur Educational Society. And she is going to present her paper on India's leap from Act East to Act Indo Pacific, Bangladesh factor. I would like to introduce Dr. Ganguly, that she uh, has been working as an Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Science, Bhavanipur Educational Society since 2012. 
She has completed her post-graduation MPhil and PhD in international relations from the Department of International Relations, Jadavpur University. She has specialized in India's foreign policy in South and Southeast Asia. She has authored many articles in various national journals and has contributed chapters in many edited books. She is an active member of two academic bodies, Council for Political Studies and Bengal Institute of Political Studies. She has presented scholarly articles in many national in international seminars and has been the co-convener of international seminar on India and Indian Ocean. She has also successfully carried out her role as a peer reviewer of the UGC enlisted journal of Kolkata Society for Asian Studies. She has been selected as the executive council member of Indian Association of Asian and Pacific Studies. Without any further delay, I would request Dr. Ganguly to present her paper. Donor. The donor can start. Hmm. We are not you are muted, Dona Kanguli. You are muted. It's not audible. Okay, Dr. Ganguly is some having some issue. She is trying to settle with that. So we can uh, by that time, surely we can go back to uh, Shatorupa. Dr. Pal, yes, if there is any question. Uh, please, uh, learned audience, please uh, raise that for Dr. Shatarupa Pal. You can write that in the chat box. Having a question for Shaturupa. If there is any comment, observation, or any feedback or anything to ask. Please uh, do the same by writing in the chat box. Do you have any questions?
The donor is not yet ready, I think. So, Dona Ganguly is present, but I think she is having the problem. So, uh. Actually, Dr. Ganguly is the second speaker and she's the last speaker for today's third academic session. We don't have any other paper uh, other than Dr. Ganguly. Okay, she's trying to jo join to her mobile. I think that will be a better idea, Dr. Dona Ganguly. <laughs> Is there any question for Dr. Shaturupa Pal? Any comments or feedback or any question? If it is there, please write that in the chat box. Okay, Dr. Ganguly has joined from her mobile. Am I audible, sir, now? Yes, That's yes, good. perfect. I'm <laughs> extremely sorry for this technical glitch. I just couldn't make out what happened to the GV. Uh, any, uh, I will not uh, waste any further time. Uh, my paper, which says India's leap from Actis to Act Indo-Pacific, the Bangladesh factor. I have divided my paper into two sections. In the first section, we just I will try to kind of explore the reasons why India uh, is sudden is trying to act Indo-Pacific, taking a leap from Actis towards Indo-Pacific, although it does not have any concrete policy, but obviously it is a strategy uh, towards Indo-Pacific on which India is embarking upon. The Second section of my paper will be on the role or rather the significance of Bangladesh in India's endeavor or in its India's foreign policy posture towards the, this region called Indo-Pacific. Now, the first to start with, India's lookist policy is the um, result of the liberalization program, which started during 1990s after the end of the Cold War. India, which became isolated and um, after the demise of the Soviet Union, uh, lost its long, uh, long partner, began to search for new alternatives for economic integration and interactions as well. India opened up its market, which was so far was uh, guided and protected by strict protectionist policies and now started to attract foreign direct investment. Now, under the able leadership of Prime, uh, Prime Minister P.V. Narsimha Rao and his finance minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, uh, India, in the hope of creating economic miracles, which uh, uh, she could witness in the Southeast Asian market, uh, announced its lookish policy in the hope to integrate with the Southeast Asian economies. India's performance in the initial years was quite stellar, uh, like India became the dialogue partner in 19, ASEAN dialogue partner in 1996, 2002, it became the summit level partner, signed a uh, free trade agreement, and now India is also a member of ASEAN regional forum and East Asian summit. However, uh, the so-called stellar performance got a hitch, got a setback, uh, uh, mainly uh, due to certain factors and the level of integration which was desired uh, to be uh, gained or achieved, it was seen it could not gain that degree or that intensity of integration as such. The main reasons behind this was first due to the poor infrastructure network in Myanmar, which happens to be the gateway uh, for India towards the Southeast Asia. This is the first reason. The second was India 
focused uh, pin top on utilizing the northeast asia uh, northeast um, uh, or northeastern part of the country as its um, corridor to, uh, towards the southeast via myanmar but not is due to its uh, which was mired in already in several insurgency movements under development poor connectivity could not help uh, india's um, uh, policy india's lucas policy much now and the third and most importantly china's growing assertiveness in the region further hampered india's relations with the asean countries now it was during this time of crisis that the in uh, our current prime minister narendra modi in 2014 after coming to power he announced uh, uh, the or rather i will say he rechristened lucas policy into actis policy and uh, where he suggested that india has uh, kind of entered into a new era of economic development industrialization and trade and would be keen on acting east by utilizing using the three c's that is connectivity commerce and cooperation now uh, with this uh, we now come to a major difference which will actually help us to understand why actist is gradually shifting to towards acting indo pacific there is a key difference of understanding between lucas policy and actist policy specifically in terms of geography geographical scope rather i will say so lucas exclusively uh, you know uh, it was based on exclusively on the uh, exclu ex exclusively on the uh, 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 on the southeast asian economy actually and uh, the uh, actist policy a uh, kind of extended its focus beyond the southeast asian economies and Sir, am I audible? Uh, not much. Not okay. much, but sometimes. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, sometimes the voice is getting okay. choked. Okay. Mm. okay. 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 So, uh, so basically, what it uh, did is that uh, the actist policy it expanded its focus beyond the East Asia, uh, beyond the Southeast Asia, and towards East Asia and the Pacific, Japan and South Korea. now japan and india in the recent years are having a bilateral uh, it's strengthening its bilateral relations to the extent that japan is investing heavily in the development of the northeast now apart from this actist policy has also expanded its focus on the integration of the security matters in the indo pacific region along with tokyo and washington india is also concerned in achieving a free and open indo pacific indo pacific region which is home to the world's busiest sea lines of communications and in securing therefore securing its security architecture is the first and foremost objective of all the regional and extra regional players in this region what is important to mention here is that uh, uh this uh, free this concept of free and open indo pacific is considered is a kind of uh, among in the sections of the academicians and policy makers it is kind of been presented as a viable alternative to china's belt and road initiative so uh uh it is mainly through this cooperation increased cooperation in uh, security cooperation and multilateralization of security engagement security architecture uh, india has also become a partner in quadrilateral security dialogue that is quad uh, which was formed in 2007 between australia india us and japan thus it marks a considerable shift in india's foreign policy conduct uh where new delhi can be seen to be shifting away from its age old policy of non alignment to a security alignment thus we can say that actist policy is gradually taking a turn towards act indo pacific in the current um, era and uh, the major concern for this shift is how to contain chinese presence in this extremely geostrategically important region of the world now coming to the second section of my paper where i like to kind of focus on the salience of bangladesh in this entire policy approach 
Now, it is uh, goes beyond doubt, uh, and it is an undeniable fact, rather, I'll say, that if India has to play a, a, a role of a, 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 of a global player, then it has to first secure its neighborhood. So naturally, neighborhood first policy um, is uh, uh, in very, uh, undeniably plays a very vital role in India's foreign policy approach in the current era. Now, uh, so in this context, it is important to mention here that the security architecture of the Quad countries, uh, uh, if you go by the security architecture of the Quad countries or rather the Indo-Pacific, the region of the Bay of Bengal is extremely vital for them. So when I talk about the region of the Bay of Bengal, obviously, it boils down, it comes down to the question of the role of Bangladesh here. So as pointed out by external affairs minister during his visit to Dhaka, S. Jai Shankar, that Bangladesh happens to be the key ally, not only in, in, in India's neighborhood first policy, but also in its activist policy and it, its larger role that India has to play in securing the Indo-Pacific region. India plays the role of a net security provider in the Indo-Pacific region. And for, and for this, Bangladesh proves to be a very vital ally in this process for her. Now, Bangladesh serves as a vital corridor to East Asia and towards the larger Indo-Pacific for India for, the, for several factors, actually. Number one, connecting the Northeast to the rest of the country through transport connectivity uh, at a very cheaper rate. Uh, the example is BBI and motor vehicle agreement, which deserves a special mention here. The digital connectivity through trade, border hearts, by boosting investment in the Indian economic zones in Bangladesh, and above all, through energy cooperation, as Bangladesh is likely to become the power corridor in the transmission of the hydro energy. Secondly, Bangladesh in the recent year provides a better alternative or a gateway to prosperity because um, the Padma Bridge has reduced the travel time, not only for the citizens, but also in ensuring a seamless connectivity from India to Southeast Asia. And uh, thirdly, Japan's increased interest in Bangladesh and, uh, uh, and the Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt, which is popularly called as Big B, which is aimed at transforming Bangladesh into the heart of the regional economy by creating a gateway between South Asia and Southeast Asia. Therefore, we can say that Bangladesh serves as a suitable anchor to convert geography into economic opportunity. However, it is always not necessary that geography translates itself effectively into economic opportunity. The persistent bilateral issues, which sometimes comes to uh, 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 which uh, at times becomes very uh, an important aspect uh, in determining the foreign policy uh, priorities of a country where it is guided by the imperatives of national interest uh, becomes uh, uh, pressing for both the countries. In case of India and Bangladesh, uh, like my previous speaker has already pointed out, issues like border killings, Tista water issue, Rohingya crisis, Citizenship Amendment Act, NRC, Islamic fundamentalism in Bangladesh. These are some. Uh, uh, in, uh, these are some uh, very uh, persistent uh, or impediments which can create obstacles in this grand design. Now, more importantly, Bangladesh also, which is even more important to mention here, Bangladesh in recent times is also embarking on its own lookist policy. And in Bangladesh, lookist policy is more, uh, you know, anchored on developing and strengthening Dhaka's relationship with Beijing. And uh, in, in context of this, and we, as we already know, that Chittagong uh, serves as one of the most important, as one of the most important pearls of uh, China's uh, string of pearl strategy. Therefore, um, uh, it is definitely a concern for India, definitely a concern for the policymakers to raise their eyebrows. So uh, basically, what we uh, see here is definitely geography can become an economic opportunity, but going by Cotillier's Mandala theory, where your immediate neighbor become your most potential ally or enemy, we cannot rule out this possibility here also. 
But the demand of the time is that you have to transcend over these bilateral issues, these thorny bilateral issues, and in order to secure not only your own national interest, but to secure the Indo-Pacific region, which is undoubtedly going to be the fulcrum of the world politics in the coming century. And with this, I would like to end my um, uh, speech here. And once again, I apologize for the technical glitch, which was absolutely unintentional on my part. I'm extremely sorry for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. So if anybody, anybody of you are having any question to Donna. Anybody is having any question for Donna? Any comments, any questions? So I thank both the speakers, Shadurupa and Dona, for their presentation tonight. And I think uh, both the papers are very insightful, but only a few things I would like to... Uh, are there any questions? Yes, there is a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, and the question is for Dr. Dona Ganguly. Uh, the question has been raised by Onne Shah. She's from the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, the University of Calcutta. Now, the question goes like this, that in regard to your first viewpoint, we know China and America are in constant tussle in South China Sea. So, ma'am, how is it possible for India have its control over it without engaging itself with Southeast Asian countries as a whole? What can be your suggestion on that? So, may I answer? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for the uh, very interesting question which you have raised. Uh, uh, to this, my I I I'm I'm not really I don't really know whether I'm anyone really worthy enough to give any suggestions, but what I uh, think is that uh, the tussle over the South China Sea is not only an issue between America and China, it is an issue between Southeast Asian countries and China as well, and if you see, it is an issue for the and the security architecture of the entire Indo-Pacific. So when you are saying that India is not get, uh, getting itself engaged in the tussle, to that I will slightly, I will differ with you saying that India is already playing a very proactive role in the security architecture of the Indo-Pacific. And by default, when it is playing the role, trying to play the role of a security provider, so uh, directly... If even if it is not directly, but indirectly, India's definite engagement in any kind of tussles between uh, China and other extra regional players, India's engagement in the uh, process becomes inevitable. Because what you know, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a grouping which is the the main objective of Quad is to contain China throughout this region. The main objective of Quad is to contain Belt and Road Initiative. All right. So India not getting itself uh, uh, engaged directly in the process uh, to that, I will say it is indirectly. It is obviously engaged in the process when its concern is to secure the Indo-Pacific at large. I hope I could answer your query. OK, thank, thank you, you Dr. Ganguly. Is there any other question, any comment, observation for uh, either Dr. Shaturupapal or Dr. Dona Ganguly? I hope there is no other question. Yes. We can wrap up and thanks to both the both the speakers and to the uh, to the participants who are here. Uh, the the papers are full of insights and I must thank both the speakers on that. But a uh, few things I wish uh, I wish to. Uh, raised today, that is, when we're talking about uh, active policy, when we're talking about um, the India's role in the Indo-Pacific region or, in, or India-Bangladesh relations, 
what I what I recall the Mahan's uh, the the Mahan's idea that whoever controls the Indian Ocean uh, controls the entire world, and whether it is Asia Pacific or whether it uh, on the other zone of the world, the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal, this region is very important. And as far as Bangladesh is concerned, it's true that through active certain things has been developed, but at the same time, many of the things has remain unattended, and it may be because of China sometimes. Now, i just give you an example uh, that in 1963, uh, uh, in the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, a place is called the Shagshgao. Uh, that place was given to China by Pakistan as a gift. And you know that that place is the origin of nearly 150 glaciers of the world. There is a fresh water. And today in the world, when you are fighting about microchips, that remains a very vital element to our understanding of international relations. The nation states are no more fighting for oil. Nation states are fighting for technology and inter trade that is, that is basically dependent on the microchip. And the warfare has started when, high, when China is controlling 150 glaciers and for the making of microchips, what we need, sand and fresh water. So now we could see that just reverse the map of India. If you reverse the map of India the other way around, uh, see the oceans are above. If you see that is a huge water resources that is sometimes under the control of China. And as far as I'm just coming back from Andaman and Nicobar Islands, where we had a very important meeting on Indo-Pacific and the Quad countries, rather. Now, what the discussion was that there are nearly 800 islands in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And out of uh, 800, uh, 800 to 804 islands, only 34 islands are uh, occupied by human beings. They stay over there. That's the inhabitants are there. Now, rest of the islands are uh, it's not for any use. Nobody is there. And sometimes Indian ships are patrolling, Indian Navy is patrolling. But there's a huge uh, potential that if you could include Andaman and Nicobar Islands with the India's active policy, what government of India is thinking of now. Because it's an extension. If you go uh, to Myanmar, and if you, just, uh, if you see uh, Myanmar is the gateway to uh, Southeast Asia, then why can't we say that Indonesia is also maybe a gateway to Southeast Asia or the Indo-Pacific in the other way around? Because it's only 200 kilometers. The last island of Andaman and Nicobar Islands uh, and Ashe, uh, the last island of Indonesia, is only 206 uh, kilometers. So if you could see the mapping that way, that geostrategically we have to reinterpret the world order again and we have to refine the India's uh, Lucas policy uh, in a newer way and near, with new modifications. Secondly, uh, Dona has talked about BBIN. Now, if you see BBIN, Bhutan is no more there. And if Bhutan is no more there, only India, Nepal, Bangladesh is there. And Bhutan is having some sort of uh, problem as far as environmental laws are concerned and environment is concerned. So the connectivity is somehow getting disrupted in one way or the other. At the same time, Bhutan is, a, is our ally and we can obviously put Bhutan into the source, but Bhutan is not having the potential to enhance production-oriented industry. So we are, we, are, we are just having the service-oriented industry in the Indian subcontinent, and maybe we have investment from China. And as I've already given the example that OBOR is one way on the other way around, the controlling of the water resources, how China is trying to control the water resources, both at the top and in the ocean, is also a very, very important agenda that India should think of. And as far as Bangladesh is concerned, there must be a continuity. Uh, again, uh, Duna has given the, the example of uh, Mandala theory, but I don't feel that for Bangladesh, Mandala theory is that way in that way applicable. Because Bangladesh and West Bengal particularly is having a continuity. Uh, you are muted, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry. Is having the continuity of history. So uh, 
uh, even if you see that uh, as far as the potential of Bangladesh is concerned, sometimes Bangladesh economy is rising very high. But we have to sort out certain things between India and Bangladesh that exist between the two nations. I don't know that what uh, the people of Bangladesh will decide in the election, in the coming election, that whether they will favor the Wami League or not, or BNP will come or Jamaat will come. But in any way or the other, our strategy should remain the same as far as Bangladesh is concerned because of connectivity, because the distance between in, uh, Kolkata and Agartala is nearly 650, 700 kilometers. Now, after partition, it was 1,800 kilometers. If, I, if we just go uh, from above. So this kind of things has to be sorted out. Ports has to be uh, developed. Now, now another important thing, developing is developing a port is only an infrastructural thing. We can develop port anytime. But to bring business in those ports. Suppose we are having in a port in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So who will go there to do the business? That is also very important. So building up a port is an infrastructural factor, but using the port for business is another important factor. So these are the things that we must keep in mind. And if we are talking about uh, Asian century, if we are talking about Quad, if we are talking about uh, a parallel kind of economy through Quad, we have to think that that has to be started from the region itself. And I'm thankful to Kolkata Society, uh, uh, Madam Shonmishra, for organizing this conference, because whatever we do, we have to think that the first non-Asian Nobel laureate is from Calcutta. So this may be the beginning uh, of an Asian century, rather. And we can obviously think of the Indo-Pacific. And we have to define Indo-Pacific in a different way. Because Indo-Pacific, again, is a uh, geopolitical term. It's not a geographical term in that way. And you know the cultural history between India and China is also very fragile. Because sometimes when Tagore went to China... Uh, during the early years of 20th century, he was not very much accepted by the youth of China, particularly in the Beijing or the Shanghai universities. But he, he came back with a very deep heart and from the China Bhavan in Calcutta. These are the stories and these are the facts that we need to analyze again to reconstruct a new uh, economic order. And at the same time, we have to think that how to how to redefine the border arts. Many of the borders are the arts are not functioning. You know, more, even if we go to More or Tamu, uh, just after COVID period, More Tamu border trade is not taking place. And what, what they're selling, they're selling Chinese products and Indians are going on the other side, even if it is open, to buy the Chinese products at a cheap, cheaper rate. Those are the bulk products. So India should think about the manufacturing industry again. If, if India really wish to sustain in the competition what we are having today. Now, I thank both the speakers. I thank all of you for being present over here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for your insight and making us aware of different interesting facts and figures of international politics. You've helped us to understand the politics behind uh, the issue that we were discussing for so long. Thank you, Shuri. So here we come to the end of the third academic session. And we shall have the fourth academic session tomorrow, that is February 17, 2023, and it shall start from 4 p.m. Thank you very much for your patience and active participation in today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.